The Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is Wednesday, April 15th, 2015, the old dreaded tax day. Dreaded for a number of reasons by many, of course, those who understand and our audience does tax, taxation, income tax. Uh, in terms of the United States Constitution, know that uh, we are being subjugated much worse than the taxes that we paid under the British rule. At any rate, I want to welcome everyone to uh, tonight's broadcast. Uh, For new listeners, many people checking in that want to say hello. Uh, Hello to each and every one of you. Thank you so much for your emails. Thanks for letting us know where you're listening from. Many people from uh, all across North America, uh, all across Europe, and uh, Australia, New Zealand. New Zealand, thank you so very much uh, for not just uh, well a couple of emails as well as a very nice letter uh, from new, uh, listener in new, new Zealand. God bless you. Thank you so very much. Uh, our broadcast time is 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern. That's Monday through Friday. Our home base is Hagman and Hagman dot com. That's you gotta spell it all out. Two ends on Hagman, Hagman and Hagman dot com. And we're simulcast. This this program is simulcast on the Christians United Broadcasting Network. There you can tune us in at the Hagman and Hagman Report dot com. We look we bring you the news. Well, we bring you what propels the news headlines. We look at the news in three D, offer analysis, and uh that is what we do. So Tonight, we've got a very special program. Mr. Paul McGuire, author, uh, great speaker, great author, fantastic author. His latest book, Mass Awakening. We're going to be talking about uh, that tonight when uh, Paul hooks up. Uh, But in the meantime, I I do want to uh, make mention of this, of course. Portions of tonight's show, sponsored by Nature Box. Nature Box ships tasty and guilt free snacks right to your door with over a hundred flavors to choose from. For example, Big Island Pineapple, Pistachio Power Clusters, Cranberry Medley. You'll never get bored of snacking again. Try Nature Box for free. All you have to do is go to naturebox.com slash CFB radio. That's naturebox.com slash CFB radio. Or even easier. Just go to Hagman and Hagman.com, scroll all the way down to the bottom and click on the box that says Nature Box. That'll take you to our special world there at Nature Box. We want to thank them for for uh, uh, being part of our, our programming. And I'll tell you what, they're a great company. It's a great product. We are customers. We love Nature Box. Joe, it's great to uh, great to be back at it behind the microphone tonight. Yes, it um, is. And I'm very excited for the show tonight. You're going to hear a ringtone. We're calling Paul McGuire back. I just uh, exchanged text messages oh, with okay. him. He's now right. in oh. position. Hey, Paul. Hey, Paul. You're on. Hey. You're live on the air. I just want to warn you about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for warning me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How are you, gentlemen? Yeah. Fantastic. How are you doing, Paul? I'm doing good. I'm doing very good. I, I got to tell you, I am so thrilled. Um, I, uh, Joe and I, uh, reading your your book uh, once again. Me for the third time, Mass Awakening. I wow. I, we we ordered yeah. Uh, we ordered some books. Uh, I gave one to a neighbor, one to a family member. Joe's got one. I've got one. And uh, uh, again, this is my third time into it. And and man, it's it's. Uh, it, it really, it's just a fantastic work. Uh, and I just want to say thank you so much for writing it and thank you for allowing me the honor to contribute the forward to that. Well, thank you for for writing the forward to it and uh I I am late, but I'm sending you a bunch of copies in the in the mail, so that's uh probably will, will arrive in the next two or three days. Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you it you know, I, and I often say this in, in my conversations with others, I I didn't think you could do better than um uh, a prophecy of the Future of America, and Standing Down Goliath. I thought, you know, every book that you've done has just gotten so much better, but I thought the, the last two were so comprehensive. But the way you, you put everything together in this latest book was just fabulous. And I just, uh, um, I am so, you know, I sing your praises to, to everyone. Not false flattery, but, but the information, the awakening, 
and, and what a great name, Mass Awakening, to wake people up. Um, it's just a, it's just an incredible amount of information in that book. But uh, anyway, I, I didn't want to sidetrack you there. I just, uh, again, just my appreciation, our appreciation for a work well done. No, I I, I, I appreciate it, and uh, you know, I I didn't think I could really write another book. After a prophecy in the future of America, I thought that was like giving birth to quad, uh, you know, what do you call it? Quadru- it's not quadruplets. It's what, what 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 happens when you give birth to four kids at once? Yeah, uh, quadruplets. Yeah, or uh, quadruplets. Okay. If, if you're the that, octo mom, that, you know. <laughs> you're right. I felt like the octo mom after I did a prophecy in the future of America, and was truly bur- burned out for a while. And then uh, I got into the uh, mass awakening, and it just came alive for me, especially uh, the message in it. You know, we wrestled with the title Mass Event, Mass Awakening. Then it was going to be Mass Event, Mass Awakening. Finally, it ended up being Mass Awakening. But there's a very, very important message in the book for the the, the moment that, uh, you know, we live in. Um, and hopefully that message will will be disseminated far and wide. So I appreciate uh, both of your help and your confidence in me and Doug, your uh, willingness to write the forward. I, I would, I do, I really appreciate it. Well, again, it's, it's my honor. And I really, uh, and folks, I, I'm not saying this um, for any other reason, except that the message in this book um, is one of, aside from the information, and, and there's a lot of information in here that really ties things together, but the message is a message of hope. It's a message of overcoming. It's a message of um, awakening. But then again, you really and this is what I was kind of focusing on in my latest uh, read, is overcoming what's being thrown at us and, and the tactics that they use in countering that. So it's really an instruction manual as well as an informational bulletin uh, of sorts. So it's really great, but, uh, you know, really excited about it. But, but boy, we've got a lot going on. The sure. new tech, you know, you're... you're uh, uh, on your website. And, and folks, Paul's website, paulmcguire.us, it's linked off of Hagman and Hagman.com. Technology, transforming America into this Orwellian brave new world state, the technology of things, the coming ISIS attacks on America, and we know they're coming, regardless of if they're orchestrated, facilitated, or independent, they're coming. Uh, Iran, Israel, Ezekiel 38, Psalm 83, Russia, Iran, the Middle East is on fire. Oh, man, everything is just... uh, And and now truth, as you write, truth is a pornography of today, and it's being censored by the power structure. And you can't even convince people that that the power structure exists because they don't want to believe it. So take us where you want to go, sir. Well, you you know, you you gave bullet points of... um all of the things that are coming at all of us, I mean, they may not be directly coming at us at this particular moment, but they, we will feel the, the aftershocks. And uh, you gave a bullet point sketch, you know. The, the, eerily, in, in the history of my research on books and writing, um, I'll write something, and uh, there's an unusual um, percentage of uh, things that happen after I write something that have to do with research. So I literally was writing an article this week, which I think you have linked to your website. <clears throat> um, but the, the working title of the article was The Coming ISIS Attacks on America. Now, I wrote that article, and I finished that article and was in the process of posting it uh, to the publisher on the Internet. And when I posted that article... And that means, you know, before it was ready for anybody to read, but it was finished. An hour later, I happened to go to the Drudge Report. This was a couple of days ago. And there was a huge story on the ISIS video that was just released where they threatened America with attacks worse than 911. And it it had all kinds of beheadings and, and threats of a monstrous attack on the United States. So I thought that was very odd. And then I recorded a video to go with it. But I wrote the article before I knew about this, you know, before I knew it would be front front page news. So um, the ISIS attacks, um, 
uh, concern me for for a number of reasons, and I know I touched on this uh, in a previous uh, interview with you. But in 2005, I wrote a book called Are You Ready, where I interviewed at length um, the uh, former Israeli general, Shimon Aram. Uh, And this was in 2005, and he talked about the dangerous triangle, which I've mentioned on your show, which is uh, uh, Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. And uh, how down there in South America in 2005, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, and and, uh, uh, later on Al-Qaeda and numerous uh, other organizations um, um, were down there and generating, you know, over $100 billion a year in sales from drug trafficking and sex trafficking and all kinds of illegal activities. And down in South America, they were spreading and recruiting and setting up terrorist training camps all over South America in 2005. And in 2005, they were moving these terrorists up through South America, across the border uh, into America via Mexico. Now, this was in 2005. So Bush was. So then we had 911, and Bush became president. And we have, uh, you know, all this discussion on on the war of, on, on terrorism, and everybody's shouting in the media. Well, if we're fighting a war on terrorism, then why do we have open borders where the terrorists, we know the terrorists are coming through? Now, that was in 2005. So now we know ISIS has been coming through. They have training camps in in Juarez, Mexico. And once again, we have to ask the question, if we're fighting a war on terrorism, why is our back door open? Um, Because they know they're coming across. They know they're coming across with weapons and other things. And, um, you know, there's no excuse for that. How can you claim to be fighting uh, a war on terrorism and you leave the borders open? So that's that's one thing. And 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 then in the article, and I know I discussed this with you, uh, Doug, uh, either the last interview or a couple of interviews ago in Russia when that school was attacked, I think it was in 2004, <clears throat> you know, uh, Chechnyan is, uh, militant Islamic terrorists uh, stormed this school and and locked it down and held the kids hostage, and it was a bloodbath. I mean, when you see the pictures of what they did in the school, uh, the terrorists did in the school in Russia, and you see hundreds and hundreds of black body bags and, and all over the um, gymnasium where the terrorists made the kids. Uh, sit, you know, the blood everywhere and the body bags fill with body bodies. And I think two days into the three-day standoff, the Russian troops just hammered the place and got the got, you know, the majority of the people out. But hundreds hundreds died. And so we know that on the top of the terrorist hit list are schools, public schools, Christian schools, Jewish schools, sporting events. Uh, shopping malls, you know, um, theaters, any place where there's a huge gathering uh, of the public is, is a potential terrorist target. So whether they hit us with nukes in American cities or an EMP attack or just a series of, you know, schools or whatever, uh, we're vulnerable to having our economy shut down and all kinds of things. And then um, I wrote in the article uh, I asked the question, which it's not an original question. Lots of people ask it. The 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 response militarily to such a series of actions would most likely be martial law. So from a purely um, uh, military standpoint and from the standpoint of pure survival, uh, one could make a case for martial law being necessary to protect the U.S. from a from from nukes and this level of terrorism. Um, um, there would have to be military control. But but the question that has to be asked is uh, the terrorists can win their war against America on two fronts. The first front is huge numbers of casualties crashing our economy, uh, nukes in American cities, and just, you know, death, devastation. That's one way a group like ISIS can win their terror war in the United States. But the second way, which is not discussed as freely and openly, is ISIS can kill America in in actually a a far worse way if ISIS uses fear and terrorism to force America 
uh, through what may be a, a what is perceived as a legitimate defensive posture of uh, establishing martial law. If ISIS can force us into that position and we become a, a military dictatorship, where and, and let's say we never go back from that military dictatorship, then ISIS has killed America in a worse way than if it had done it with bombs or mass killings because however imperfect, America is still shining a light to the nations. And if ISIS can force America to be a full-blown totalitarian Orwellian state where all our freedoms are gone and we're in total military lockdown, then America as we know it and America as the world knows it, which is a light to the world, is dead forever. The American dream, the American vision, again, however imperfect, they have killed it if they force us to become a full-blown totalitarian state. So the question has to be asked, and as I watch the politicians, I'm not impressed at all with the field on the left or the right. I don't hear any of them talking about our freedoms. And and where is the legislation, where is the proactive legislation uh, that should be put in place so if we do go through a national crisis, we're guaranteed by the weight of law that we get our nation back and that after the crisis is over, uh, the American way of life is returned to us. Because right now, uh, if we went into martial law, and that may be, again, for, for prudent military reasons, if we don't get America back after the crisis, then we have been killed just as certainly as if they did it with nukes. And our our you know these guys on the left and the right... Uh, <laughs> I'm very pessimistic. I see a bunch of paid-for men. Uh, I don't see a, a chance, and, and, and it's not, you know, these guys are controlled men, and none of them, none of them are standing for our freedoms and standing for our future. They are the, they are the lackeys of uh, globalist corporations, every single one of them. There isn't a man out there, in my opinion, who's truly uh, an independent voice, and those that some people think are independent voices, in my opinion, are, are simply spoilers. Boy, I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you look as an independent, for example, Rand Paul, um, it comes to mind. Well, if you, if you look at his actions uh, during the last presidential campaign, it, it almost appeared that, um, that, that he single-handedly took out his father from, from the running or from consideration and there's a question as to why that happened, but aside from that, regardless of who does get in the office of the presidency, um, I, there's there's not going to be any change as far as I'm concerned, and certainly there's no congressional move to make change. So my question no. is, you know, and, and looking, having read your books from the day the dollar died through onward through the present uh, mass awakening. You bring this up a number of times. Um, you know, the, the, what's the agenda here? If no one's doing anything, is it merely incompetence? I don't think so. And I know you don't either. There, there's a back agenda here. There, there's this covert agenda. And people, more people are saying, well, the government's just incompetent. Well, I mean, how much competence does it take to uh, enforce a border? You know, how much competence does it take to um, address the illegal immigration issue? Um, that doesn't take that much brain, that many brain cells. You know? I, well, I totally agree with you. I don't think, uh, I think this uh, idea of calling our elected representatives incompetent is a complete fiction. Um, I don't think our government is incompetent. I don't. I think anybody who who makes the mistake in calling President Obama incompetent, that person's a fool. <laughs> President Obama yeah. and his administration are not incompetent. And Bush, when he ran up the deficit, uh, Bush Jr. as I call him, he's not incompetent. Uh, they're not incompetent in their ability not to to seal up the borders. This is not about their competence. They are fully. They are far more competent. So being angry at them and calling them incompetent is missing the big picture. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you said they're not incompetent, incompetent, and we see, you know, all these foreign policy 
disasters now uh, from the Obama administration that you know started from the, even the first Bush administration with this Middle East destabilization. Um, do you have any hope from anybody in the? I mean, I know that we see the politicians um, that will possibly be the next president, whoever that will be. Uh, we see the the people are, are taking making their announcements, taking the stages, and you know their campaigns are beginning to be launched. Um, is there anybody that you would, would could imagine uh, that could do anything to even push us or point us in the right direction as a uh, presidential contender right now? Well, um, <clears throat> you know, let's just uh, open up the question uh, up further. And I don't believe for a moment that Hillary Clinton is incompetent. I don't believe that her foreign policy was due to incompetence. I don't think, again, Obama is incompetent. I don't think Bush Jr., as I call him, uh, uh, was incompetent. None of this is – this is not a competence issue. Um, you know, the, 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 the trillion-dollar deficit soaring, that's not due to incompetence. Um, you know, if, if – if, you're analyzing the situation and you think that these people are incompetent then you then you're missing the message so um so the reality is that uh, we have six uh, just six corporations that control you know 99% of the media so uh you know i know this sounds kind of like fatalistic but you know <laughs> it is what it is the entire galaxy if you will of of uh, the vast majority of conservative media stars on radio and TV and the other uh, media personalities, they're all controlled by the six major corporations. So you've got all these people who are just you know, in love with so-and-so on the radio and in love with so-and-so on the radio because they're conservative and they're saying all, you know, they're calling this person a moron, that person a moron, and talking all this tough talk well all that is is theater for the masses to get, to give them a sense of uh, a release of emotional tension a discharge of, of of pent up emotion and all of those people and i can think i could, their their faces are playing in my head right now the guys on tv that are supposedly conservative it's all theater it's just a big play and they know what role they're playing and uh, they may know, you know, they may, they, they most likely in many cases uh, know far more than they're letting on, but they know they'd be fired if they ever went that way. It's a big circus. It's a, it's a giant circus uh, designed to keep, um, you know, I've been living long enough uh, now to look at the uh, ping pong game between Republicans and Democrats and how we switch presidents, uh, you know, usually every eight years. And nothing, nothing changes, man. At a certain point of watching so many elections where nothing changed, okay, minor changes, cosmetic changes, you know, you got to come to the conclusion like a car uh, hitting a, a cement wall at 95 miles an hour. You got to come to the conclusion that these parties are controlled by the same people because they're pushing the same agenda. If you, you, you can exactly. even listen to the, the speeches of some of these. Uh, Moderates who have become conservatives because they know in order to win the uh, Republican primaries, they have to move from moderate to, to a conservative position. But they're globalists. They're moderates. And if you listen carefully to, to their language, they've already built in their loopholes into their speeches. Uh, that's very true. And uh, one thing that I, I, when I was doing research for tonight, and actually I've been working on a, on a research or a, a publication, an article, uh, report, <clears throat> and a lot of it is based on what you've written and what you've talked about. But, but one thing that uh, sticks out in my mind, that based on the research, especially now that you've got all these people announcing their candidacy for uh, for the presidency, um, it, it, again, it doesn't matter. Like you said, it doesn't matter. But one thing that I found extremely interesting is the common thread that you point out, and. There's so much more to this than people realize is the 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 creation of the Fabian society, the Fabian socialists, and 
we you know we, we certainly we can go back to biblical times and and start with Nimrod and go forward. But in terms of modern times, the Fabian Society, the Fabian Socialists, this elite group of of, of false intellectuals, basically, who form this semi-secret society to bring socialism into the world. Um, the window, that infamous window, the stained glass window unveiled by Tony Blair in uh, 2006, where you've got the uh, picture of the, the crest, the official Fabian crest, where it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. I, I mean, and then you... Then you look at the membership list for the Fabian Society and see conservatives and Marxists all working to the same ends. They're globalist multiculturalists. They're, um, you know, so, so it all comes down to this framework of, of what would you call them, of, of elitists, of globalists, multiculturalists with very nefarious motives. And, and at, the, at the heart, I suppose, or one of the biggest uh, things our groups as the Fabian socialists that are affecting all of us or affecting the agenda. Well, yeah, you're right. And that, and that's um, the, the major message of mass awakening and, and the major of mass uh, message of mass awakening. <clears throat> there's a, there's a huge answer and solution in the book, but, but you can't get to the solution and the answer until you understand the problem. So uh, basically we live in, and this is very hard. You know, I was saying this at the Prophecy Conference where you guys were down there when we were down there in Orlando. <clears throat> and uh, what I've been saying lately is is a, is a spin-off of, of a theme that I've been talking about for a long time. But I'm, I'm trying to communicate to people the fact that, <clears throat> you know, we live in what Aldous Huxley termed a scientific dictatorship. You know, that's not just a cute phrase. It's not just a nice expression. Uh, it's a reality. Now, people don't understand. The the average person doesn't understand uh, what you mean when we say we live under a scientific dictatorship. But going back to the quote that, that I probably quoted on every radio interview I've ever done with you guys, but paraphrasing it, Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World, uh, said in a speech in 1961 to a bunch of neuropsychiatrists on the west coast of California that the truly efficient dictatorship is a scientific di dictatorship where with uh, mind control techniques, uh, drugs, brainwashing, hypnosis, etc., we can indoctrinate men and women to love their slavery or love their servitude. So people can exist in a scientific dictatorship, not even know they're in it, and love it. And that's basically the most efficient form of a dictatorship. So that's um, essentially what America and much of Europe has become. Um, p people don't understand <laughs> that we live in a scientific dictatorship where people love the dictatorship and uh, they love their servitude because they're under a very sophisticated uh, mind control, not the old KGB style, Adolf Hitler style mind control. Now, this is very high level stuff where where people are intoxicated with all kinds of pleasures and diversions. And, you know, they, everybody's got a little earphone in their head and they're living in their own universes. Uh, people people are so dumbed down that, that they can't even critical, critically think when they... Uh, uh, are making a choice for, t for for a vote. So we're being controlled in, in, in a, the highest order or highest level conspiratorial sense. But if you even bring that up, the average person will go will act like a like a parrot uh, that's been shot up on amphetamines and go berserk and squawk over and over again conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory, hysterically. Uh, on cue because they've been programmed to do that because people cannot think out of the matrix people have been programmed to think in in a small box of consciousness and if you dare think outside the box of consciousness and if you dare suggest that there's a world beyond the american matrix that tiny box of pre-programmed consciousness they will get angry at you they will salivate like dogs they will bite you 
They will call you conspiracy theorist, a nut, and every name under the sun. And the people who are calling you these names, they are uh, Manchurian candidates, perhaps not to program to, to kill, but program to kill anybody verbally who would dare suggest uh, that they're under scientific mind control. Uh, they, they go ballistic, and that hostility is not just um, uh, the result of denial. That hostility is programmed into them. Hmm. That's true. We we had a, a listener send us an email before the show in anticipation of your appearance, since you're on the subject of mind control. Um, this is from Marie. Uh, she said, I read Mass Awakening. Uh, could you please ask Paul? to elaborate on the mind uh, control, but specifically like mind reading technologies. She said, it's it's hard to believe, um, for example, how close do they, you know, do, 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 those people, do people have to be um, basically wanting the, um, well, kind of a, a, an explanation in terms of, of mind control, mind manipulation, mind reading even. So that, that's from Marie. So I, at any time you want to get into that. No, I'll get, I'll get into it now. That's, that's, a really good, that's a really excellent question. And, and, and to, the way that, and I, I document uh, what I mean by uh, these kinds of technologies in the book, uh, Mass Awakening, I document the technologies because I knew people wouldn't believe they existed if I told them. So I document the technologies from mainstream sources. So so the first thing is is that people don't understand that we have technology and science and have had since the 40s that is so far beyond uh what that they can conceive and I know I've used this expression before that they think it's in the realm of science fiction. They just don't think it's possible that we have technology that can read minds. But I'm telling you, we had technology that could read minds on a primitive level beginning in the 40s and uh, uh, other things like that. So if people can understand this, whatever level of science and technology that the average person thinks exists right now, extend it 100 years into the future because that's where we really are. Okay, And, And I'll give you a quick example of that. Uh, there's an episodic TV program, uh, uh, Homeland, you know, with the blonde mm-hmm. actress. Okay, so there's there's this scene in Homeland, and the ter- the the, uh, it's, the government is tracking the terrorists. Okay, and uh, what what Homeland uh, uh, shows is that the technology of the ability of the government to track the terrorists. Uh, they can do it through the cell phone when the cell phone is turned on. And then when the cell phone is turned off or hidden, uh, they, 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 they lose their ability to track. Now, that <laughs> that uh, scenario in, in the TV series was the deliberate concealment of how far beyond uh, we are technologically than that state. Because the idea of turning on a cell phone to monitor somebody, we knew that was a technological reality about 10 years ago uh, when there was a big case with a mobster and the mafia in New York City, and it was disclosed in the New York Times and other news media that that they were able to, to, turn, to turn on the cell phone and listen, even when it was off, and listen through the cell phone. But in this uh, Homeland episode, they led you to believe that, gee, if you turn your phone off, then you're safe. But right. ten years ago, they were, they're able to turn the phone on. And the other thing is that you know the the, the cell phone, whether it's on or off or whatever, it is is always transmitting. That's just one little example. But let's get into some other examples. Mind reading technology. Currently, and this has been operational for quite a few years, they have technology which. Um, uh, and does like uh, brain scans uh, from a distance, and they can tell whether a person is angry, depressed, upset, uh, violent, et cetera, et cetera. And these, uh, this technology has been employed 
in in public areas of transportation for a number of years and in other areas. So they're electronically, um, they can't read, that technology cannot, quote, read your thoughts, but can read your emotions. They know if you're angry, depressed, hostile, sexual, whatever it is, they can, they can, they can read your emotional state. So that's a form of mind reading, and that's been around for 15 years. Sure. Um, in addition to that, the technology to project visual images inside people's heads uh, in dreams and to hear voices subliminally and audibly, uh, that's been around for 20 years, and you can do that externally. And then, you know, this is not stuff I'm making up. You can read a current uh, issue of Wired magazine or these popular technological magazines. They're all over the Internet where... Um, MIT and Stanford and other research institutes are uh, developing technology that can read your mind, see the visual images in your mind uh, from a distance and project visual images uh, um, into your mind and hear your thoughts audibly. So this computer brain interface uh, can be done with electrodes or without electrodes and um, I'm sure it's not crystal clear like like reality, but they can see your thoughts and your dreams to to whatever extent. And we don't know to what extent, but it's far more than what most people realize. So mind reading technology, that's been around in a primitive stage for 20 years, and it's it's in all the popular scientific uh, technological magazines. Every week there's something new coming out about it. So um, this, is, can, can this they, is not new. Can, can they do this on a uh, on a mass level? Now, the, a lot of the questions I'm asking now are, are just you know, put, putting the book aside, not uh, uh, as if you know I, I didn't read this. I, I, just coming at this from a, um, a a very secular lay level here. Um, well, let, let, let's just say you're in Penn Station in New York City, where it's always busy. There's throngs of people there. Mm-hmm. Are we looking at a device, perhaps, or devices, or, or whatever the the actual device might be? Number one, it, it would be like a CAT scan type uh, device where it would show like parts of the brain would light up and turn if you're angry. You know, there's a certain part of the brain that kind of uh, uh, lights up, or if you're, right. you know, excited uh, sexually or stimulated sexually. Uh, perhaps right. you know you're you're uh, there's a perverse uh, individual there rubbing up against someone another end of or in another part of the brain. Uh, number one, do they have um, the do they have the ability to like scan the large crowds? And number yes. two, okay, and would it be with, with like a CAT scan type of technology? I'm not sure that the precise uh, uh, technology, but I but I would venture to say it would be a variation of a CAT scan type technology. And uh-huh. it may be, my my guess is, based on the way all the research goes, it's probably a lot farther along than we realize. But let's just say, let's just talk conservatively and, and say, yeah, there's, there is operationally some kind of CAT scan type technology that can read emotional states like in Penn Station. And it probably shows up as different colors radiating in different parts of people's brains which reflect moods etc yeah wow i mean for all the good the potential good that a technology like this and i'm not advocating this at all but one can see where this could prevent perhaps um the terrorist attack you know or at least that could be argued you know but but it's it's not being used for that it's the, the invasiveness I mean, who would have thought when the framers were talking about our Fourth Amendment rights and uh, that, that this would ever come into play? Uh, wow. All right. Well, well. I mean, let's take Penn Station or other public areas. I mean, the, the, the argument could be made, or a sports stadium or whatever where people are going in, the, a very strong argument could be made that that technology, which, of course, is invasive and intrusive, but that technology uh, would be very useful in scanning out potential terrorists. So, the, so, so a very strong case could be made that uh, these technologies uh, can be 
powerful tools to protect uh, the, the American people. And I'm, I'm not disregarding that, but but uh, l- let's just take it further. Let's get let's get into the area of uh, uh, cell phone te- technology. So everybody's saying, well, you know, how close do I have to be to a device or whatever? Well, you got a cell phone next to your brain. Okay, that cell phone uh, transmits all kinds of information over a cell phone signal. The new cell phones uh, that just came out, um, uh, the uh, what is it, the iPhone six or whatever, mass you can buy them with massive amount of gigabytes. Every time they expand, it's not just the iPhone. It's uh, Microsoft has their version also. You have a you have an electronic device that you're placing against your skull. Now, this is a no-brainer. If you have an electronic device that, that is placed against your skull, you can read, if somebody wanted to, that cell phone is the perfect instrument. You don't need an electrode strapped to somebody's head. That cell phone serves an elect- as an electrode and can read all kinds of stuff, of uh, information in your mind, and project stuff into your mind. Not to mention brainwave states, that it can create, like alpha, you know, beta, delta, gamma, epsilon, so right. on and so forth. So, so you know, you you have that. Now, the other thing you have is you have um, an area. You know, people are always worried about cell phones. Well, uh, cell phones can generate brain waves in in huge geographic areas, but that's primitive technology. They have other uh, antenna sources that are far more powerful than cell phone technology that utilize scalar wave technology so you can have a a a mind control grid over a city or areas or or whatever i mean we live in a science fiction future it's not it's not what's coming it's 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 here now so uh mind reading technology is here and has been for 20 years and it's going to it's going to escalate exponentially mm. uh, wow well. Yeah, you know, the increasing technological rollout uh, from, you know, the tools used to create a scientific dictatorship, uh, moving, you know, the economic uh, into a digital, uh, economic and health are the two big ones I see right now. They're trying to transform the healthcare system into a uh, mobile healthcare uh, ability to implement some sort of device or attach some sort of device to people where it would then in real time feed this health information back to the doctors, which would in turn feed it back to the government, creating uh, through IBM and other co- uh, companies a massive health database, digital database, and uh, they are seeking, it's already the law, uh, signed into law on September 27, 2013, uh, put into the Federal Register, that implantable devices would soon be used. Uh, for economic health data and uh, counter surveillance measures, they say. Um, in in your mind, Paul, from all the the technological advances we've seen, for all the steps that we've taken further and further, you know, we see the transhumanism agenda really uh, coming out full steam. And where it says in the Bible that you know the mark of the beast will be given out during the uh, tribulation period. Do you see this uh, all encompassing chip? Because they start out with a health information, but they also expand on to the economic uh, abilities that this could have, as well as the tracking capabilities. Pretty much just, you know, what Orwell wrote about, uh, everybody is uh, tagged and, and watched, and uh, every movement is is, is uh, monitored, and, you know, nobody goes and works outside of this system that they incorporate. Right, is this the, the beginning, or would this implementation be the end of, of you know, private uh, living aside from unless you're plugged into the system no i think you're right i think it's all encompassing um i forgot how many years ago it's been a number of years ago i wrote a book called are you ready for the microchip so that was written uh before the health care bill was passed and all that and uh people went ballistic when i wrote the book because i made the suggestion that that there, there there was legislation that allowed for a microchip implant in the health care bill before the health care bill actually came out. And I got all these emails and people screaming at me, which is the norm of my life anyway. So, <laughs> so and I don't care. So, um, because what I did is uh, I, I, I quoted uh, 
uh, passages of the proposed uh, health care bill where um, um, it talks specifically about a uh, RFID uh, med chip. Uh, I don't think they used the word med chip, but it was it was language that meant the same. So it was obvious that in the initial uh, drafting of the health care bill before it actually came out, there was language which led one to believe that the, a med chip would be used, an RFID med chip. So yes, that's that's going to happen. Now, again, the big the big problem we have in the United States is people don't know anything about history, so they have no frame of reference. Uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, uh, the former name of Russia, um, was a was a very dark dictatorship. And one of the primary ways that the Soviet Union dictatorship controlled the people is they used uh, uh, psychiatric medicine, uh, became political. So you were classified as insane uh, by the Soviet Union. You were clinically insane if you opposed the goals of the Soviet Union, and you were sent into mental hospitals. Now, so huge numbers of people were drugged and sent into mental hospitals, not because there was anything wrong with them, but because they didn't agree with the ideology of the Soviet Union. So the potential danger for the politi- uh, political uh, uh, you know, control of people through psychiatry and technology is is through the roof. So when you allow a microchip implant into somebody, you now have the capacity to monitor their thoughts. You can hook them up to a computer brain interface. This is not some far-fetched future thing, and this is going to come up in the next few years. Uh, you can control thoughts. You can monitor thoughts, and then you can let people buy or sell. And what this is going to do, and this is what people really, really need to, you know, turn on their brain, you know, just turn it on, the whole thing on, not just like 10% of their brain, turn 100% of their brain on. In the book of Revelation, where it clearly says that there will be a coming one world religion, one world economic system, and one world government, uh, administrated by a false prophet, uh, and above the false prophet will be a world charismatic uh, leader that the Bible calls the Antichrist in Revelation 13, we're not that far from that because uh, this microchip, nanochip, or now it could even be it's a DNA particle that can function as a nanochip. So, so, so the chip could be actually the size of a collection of DNA. Um, you know, that's how that's how tiny it could be to function. So, you what what the goal is, and this goes all the way back to H.G. Wells the science fiction writer and former head of British intelligence in World War I, and Aldous Huxley and the other Fabian socialists, they plan this out. They plan. People need to understand that these men were thinking about this uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. They, um, uh, H.G. Wells came up with the concept of a world brain and a hive mind. And so what that will mean is that everybody who has this chip with the computer brain interface, um, they will be connected to one giant brain called the world brain or a hive mind. Now this, this, and I talk about this and document this in my book, Mass Awakening. So this is a perfect interface where you have communistic, collectivistic thinking. And in in the communist paradigm of thought, the individual does not count. It's the state or the collective that counts. And also in Eastern mystical religions, and this is one of the reasons that when I was in the New Age movement and I was practicing Eastern mysticism and I was uh, working my way to to being enlightened, I, uh, I saw the great white light, I experienced cosmic consciousness and all that stuff, but... I really wasn't, and I was not a Christian, and I wasn't excited about uh, New Age enlightenment or Buddhist enlightenment or Eastern mystical enlightenment because because the goal was to achieve what they called perfect nothingness, that you would die completely to yourself and you would become one with the universe, that you as an individual would disappear. And I thought that was pretty repulsive. So the Eastern mystical I, I, uh, Eastern mystical philosophy it's very interesting how Eastern mystical philosophy 
blends perfectly or integrates perfectly with the communistic idea of collectivism. The, all that matters is the state. And in Eastern mystical philosophy, you merge, uh, you, your individuality disappears and you become one with the universe. It's interesting how both of those thought streams totally interface with the Fabian socialist vision of a hive mind or a world brain where everybody's individuality will disappear and they will exist solely to serve the world brain or the hive mind or the false prophet and the Antichrist. Now, I want to slip one little thing in here, and I hear this being mouthed uh, by Republican candidates and Democratic candidates. If you listen very carefully to what they're saying regarding education, and you really pay close attention and you raise your perception up, you, 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 you turn your perception on and you take it from 10%, and let's just go to 37% perception versus 10%, which is where most people exist, and you listen carefully to what both political parties are saying about education. They are getting you ready for the idea of cradle-to-grave education, where the state tests your child regarding aptitudes, and the state determines what their careers will be in the future as young children. And therefore, uh, many kids will not go to college. They will just graduate high school, and they'll uh, learn to be, and just, yeah, I'm quoting somebody, but I'm not mentioning their name, welders or electricians. But what was left out in that political statement was that the state is going to eventually test your child so all these people who didn't fit into the box as kids, which is just about every great entrepreneur who ever lived, the state is going to choose your child's career for you through testing. You won't have a choice. And that's the purpose. People See, the, the, the Christian community and the, the uh, religious community and Christian education and the Christian e educational establishment is, you know, is notoriously naive notoriously naive, and they're about to be sucker-punched in the face so hard that the nose is going to be flattened against their skull because the purpose of, for example, um, Common Core and some of these other uh, edu uh, educational technologies is to create massive dissatisfaction in the public schools, okay, and then give people the money to go to private schools like religious schools and charter schools. So all the Christians and all the secular people are standing up and cheering and the euphoric and thinking, gee, we're going to get a great education, but they're about to get hit in the face with a, a sucker punch because they're not reading the fine print, especially the Christian schools. Yeah, you're going to get the money that was going to the public school and Christian schools will now receive money like charter schools, but the fine print is that the charter schools and the Christian schools, the parent will have absolutely no say-so or influence in the curriculum. It will be totally feder federalized, and it will be hermetically sealed. You will not be able to penetrate the barrier to complain about cu uh, curriculum or anything else, and at least with the public schools that people don't like, you can complain. You can become part of the PTA. You can protest. You can make some effort at changing the curriculum. With the charter schools and the new funding for the Christian schools, the government will control everything, and the parent's voice is dead. But the Christian educational establishment is too naive to see the, to see the 1,000 tanks coming across the desert you know, with their with their guns, and <laughs> take them out. Yeah, that's very true. Um, if I can just add something here with respect to uh, the education aspect of this, uh, just very very quickly, kind of a side note here. You know, I, I, a lot of people don't understand. Uh, for example, the United States Department of Education. That, that this a relatively new cabinet. It was it was uh, what it became operational back in the late seventies, early eighties. I'm gonna say nineteen seventy nine and nineteen eighty something somewhere around there. But um, and it was well, it was under Carter anyway. Um, it, it's a very small cabinet, uh, 
position, or it's a very small cabinet, a very small department of our of our federal government. But um, in it, while I was looking through doing research as well, you know, for tonight and uh, the things you had mentioned in your book. I, I, I found out that the uh, secretary of the Department of Education, a guy by the name of, uh, oh my goodness, Arnie, uh, uh, Arnie Duncan, um, he, he's, a, he's a current secretary, and he, uh, you talk about mind control and uh, talking about the uh, how we're molding public perception. Back a couple of years ago, Duncan had made a comment about. Common Core or the opposition to Common Core, and uh, he, he characterized the opposition as having come from white suburban moms who all of a sudden, um, uh, but believe you know that their child isn't as brilliant as they thought their child was. Or so I'm paraphrasing here. But I said all that to say this: the integration of mind control, the integration of Cradle to grave education, as you mentioned, uh, it's not a new concept, but it's one that has gained extreme. And, oh, and this is Duncan, the head of the uh, Department of Education, is from Chicago. Uh, Chicago school system used to head that, um, and I thought that was rather, uh, well, humorous. I, I don't, I don't know if that's the right word, but interesting to say the least. But all of that, all of this that we're seeing here is the children, uh, Paul, seem to be the target commodity of this Fabian socialistic um, uh, initiative. And boy, they're really doing a number on our children. And, um, you know, we're not realizing the extent, I believe anyway, we're not realizing the extent of the damage being done and the uh, hostage taking that is being done by these people. No, and in my book, Mass Awakening, I document all this, and in front of me, I have my book, but I also have um, some articles in front of me um, from Dennis Cuddy on Common Core, which are excellent. And uh, then I have some other research that I put in my book, uh, Mass Awakening. But, look, look, you know, people are talking about and I was talking about technology and scientific mind control. But scientific mind control began <clears throat> long before technology was available. So going back to the Illuminati, which is a real organization, not a fictitious one, and, and I always have to say that because there are people who are just so incredibly stupid, I get them. Uh, there's these attack websites that are financed by a very... Very, very wealthy billionaire whose name will remain unnamed for the moment, who finances over a thousand attack websites. But the Illuminati um, planned uh, back in 1907 and before that. Of course, the Illuminati was formed in 1776. But when you go back to the beginning of the educational system, right at the very beginning, you see the influence on the Illuminati on education. So, for example, in the in the uh, 1800s, uh, 1806, for example, you had um, <clears throat> socialists um, who came to the United States uh, that were implementing Illuminati programs in the 1800s, and <clears throat> this is the words of uh, a man who, who, who was reviewing the curriculum uh, that the Illuminati had sponsored for the public schools. Now, there was a guy named Horace Mann uh, in the 1800s who, who was known as the father of the American public educational system. And so when uh, there was a hearing to look at the curriculum for the uh, American public educational system uh, way back in the 1800s, this is what was written uh, by a very intelligent expert um, who who uh, <clears throat> examined the curriculum. And he wrote, quote, the great object, and he was talking about 
of the, the educational curriculum in the public schools. The great object was to get rid of Christianity and to convert our churches into halls of science. The plan was not to make open attacks upon religion, although we might belabor the clergy and bring them into contempt where we could, <clears throat> but to establish <clears throat> excuse me, but to establish a system of state, we said national schools from which all religion was to be excluded, in which nothing was to be taught except knowledge as is verifiable by the senses. Now, verifiable by the senses means materialism, so therefore God can't exist. Because you can't see God, you brainwash in the children into saying God doesn't exist because you can't see, you can't see it. So this, this um, movement began in the 1800s. Now, um, you, had, you had other uh, um, things. Like in 1848, the, the, the Communist Manifesto was published. And just a few years, nine years after the Communist Manifesto uh, was published, and one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto provided for a combination of education and industrial production, which, was the, which is the prototype of a school-to-work program which is what they're implementing here in the United States. When you listen carefully to the Republicans as they speak about education or the Democrats, they're, they're, they're tipping their hand that they're moving us towards uh, a school-to-work approach. So nine years after the Communist Manifesto was written, guess what? The NEA, the National Education Association, was formed, and uh, an Illuminati member... Um, uh, Wilhelm Wundt uh, established a, a laboratory of uh, psychology, uh, and he studied Pavlov. And uh, one of his early students was Gus Stanley Hall, uh, the founder of the American Communist Party in the United States, who mentored another father of the American educational system, John Dewey. You know, every library has the Dewey Decimal System. And then... Dewey, in 1869, um, had a huge influence on the American educational system. And he, he got his money from John D. Rockefeller Sr. in 1902, created the General Education Board, and then they loved to use Christian ministers as the, the, the big suckers in radical social transformation. So Rockefeller... Uh, appointed Frederick Gates, a Baptist minister, as chairman of this first uh, uh, run at a, a national educational system for American schools. And he wrote uh, a newsletter called The World's Work uh, that he started publishing in 1912. And then in 1917, it, they founded the New York Board of Education, and then when you read, again, with Rockefeller money, when you read what their goal was, and this is, this is chilling, because this is how Common Core started. Social history of the American family, and, and what, here's the quote that, that of what they were teaching and what, what their plan is. And, and, and so when you hear Hillary Clinton say, say things like, it takes a a village to raise a child, or it takes a community to raise a child, or it takes a collective to raise a child, or it takes a communitarian society to raise a child. That's right out of the Communist Playbook. And so in 1919, this is what uh, the curriculum they planned and the, and the goal for it. Uh, quote, the child passes more and more into the custody of community experts. Quote, the new view is that higher and more obligatory relation is to society rather than the family. The family goes back to the age of savagery, while the state belongs to the age of civilization. The modern, ind the modern individual is a world citizen, of, which is code for Illuminati, consisting of only the parents and the children. Uh, society saw how many were unfit for parenthood, and began to realize the need for community care. As the family weakens, society has to assume uh, larger parenthood. So where this is going, and you hear it in the verbiage, I heard it in the verbiage of the, the current darling uh, presidential ca candidate of the Republican Party last night. 
as he talked about education. But if you listen very, very carefully, and not like somebody with a 10% perception level, you saw that he was talking about, in code, this system. And I'm going to read you a quote of this system. The kindergarten grows downward toward the cradle, and there arises talk of neighborhood nurseries. It it seems clear that at least in the early stages, socialism will mean an increased amount of social control. And then it it evolves itself that the state runs the the child. It's cradle-to-grave education. And in 1992, Hillary Clinton uh, gave a speech about their plan to implement cradle-to-grave education for everybody. So that's the goal. And the goal was to destroy the church, to destroy the family, and to destroy Judeo-Christian thought and have a world socialist indoctrination system, and that's what we have now. Yeah, they're certainly doing a good job of that. And uh, we'll hit on that on the other side, how the churches are being affected and the families of these congregations, from the pastors to the congregations. And uh, you devoted a lot of your book um, to the Remnant Church of America, and you made some uh, great arguments and and came at it from a few different angles describing you know the the problems with the church in America today, and we'll get on into that on the other side after this quick break. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Our guest tonight is Mr. Paul McGuire. His latest book is Mass Awakening. Uh, pick that up on his website, paulmcguire.us, or you can go to Hagman and Hagman Report and find the links uh, to his book there. And uh, it's a fasc- fascinating and fantastic book. It is, uh, I would say, a, a compilation of the last few of his books plus uh, so much more information from A Prophecy of the Future of America to Standing Down Goliath. Uh, This latest one again is Mass Awakening. Uh, Pick that up if you can. When you can, it is a fascinating read. We'll be right back. Number two on the Hagman and Hagman Report this Wednesday, April 15th, 2015, where our guest tonight is Paul McGuire. Bookmark his website. PaulMcGuire.us is the website. Catch all his latest content, articles, and YouTube videos. Uh, there are some new YouTube videos up there and uh, some new articles that, that Paul has recently put out. Paul, in, in this hour, uh, I guess let's go back to the the c- uh, collective mind, the uploading the mind to the conscious, so a one-world uh, conscious. We see this in the transhumanist agenda, the, the tech titans, as they write their articles explaining how all people will connect through this hive mind, this uh, sort of artificial intelligence plus human intelligence, uh, collective brain. Now, we know that uh, the Lord tells us we are not of this world and we're not to conform to the world, and we're warned about you know the dangers of this hive mind mentality. Uh, do you see what, what will happen when uh, these people do turn themselves over and connect to this hive mind? Are they going to be almost like programmed drones carrying out tasks or the will of this uh, active hive mind or what people or these elites and powers that be put into the hive mind for them to uh, act on? Well, the first thing I would want to say is that even before the technology is um, in place, let's say with a microchip implant or a DNA implant of some kind, that would uh, uh, create a computer brain interface and connect people uh, to a world brain or a hive mind. And let's make no mistake about it <laughs> that, that you know, this is not a, a collectivist, you know, we are the people, we are one, like John Lennon kept singing about. He was a heroin addict. Let's, be, let's, let's face it, it was a heroin addict shooting up junk in Manhattan worth $500 million, and he was singing about how we're all going to be one. Well, that's part of this hive mind concept. Um, um, the elite... The, the scientific elite, the occult elite, have no intention of being one with the masses in the hive mind. The hive mind is, is an extension of Aldous Huxley's scientific dictatorship. So really, when we go beyond cybernetics, computer technology, holographic reality, computer brain interfaces, and transhumanism, this one electronic cybernetic global consciousness is a slave system uh so that the masses will be the will be the workers and slaves 
for the elite, but the elite will not be part of the hive mind. They will be above the hive mind in the same way that in the movie Elysium, the elite left the planet and they were up there in outer space while the masses of humanity uh, toiled in slavery down here on Earth. The elite are not going to be part of this hive mind. That's for the slaves. So people need to understand that. They're being sucker punched because the, the, the elite are not going to come out and tell them uh, you know, we have a world brain, but guess what, folks? You're not gonna, we're not gonna be part of the world brain. We're gonna rule the world brain. That's that's the 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 ultimate reality. But even before all this technology is finally put into place, people are behaving, including Christians and Christian churches. People are behaving as if they were already part of a world brain or a hive mind. Yeah. In in, in the fact that their their thoughts are all socially engineered to to, to to go into the same direction. That's the, that's the danger. Now, the other thing is that we have to realize is that, you know, the personal living God of the universe, the God of the Bible, is not intimidated, nor has he ever been intimidated, by this level of technology and science and computers and talk of hive minds and world brains and computer brain interfaces and nanochip DNA implants. The personal God of the universe who lives beyond space and time and who can see the end from the beginning, is not even minimally upset. I mean, he doesn't even have a look of consternation in his face because it, talk about a cosmic super brain, and God is so much more than a cosmic super brain. It's a completely inadequate adjective to, to describe him. But God is not a world brain. God is the the brain of everything. He is more than a brain he is the deity and he is the great i am and as the great i am he his existence uh permeates every cell of every galaxy and universe and dimension simultaneous time, simultaneously he is the fullness that fills all in all he is so far beyond huxley's uh, world brain in the hive mind and Ray Kurzweil's, uh, you know, transhumanist future. He is so far beyond cyborgs and androids and genetic implants. He is the author of the DNA code. He's the creator of the DNA code. So so uh, people who say that they believe in God need to have um, their consciousness reframed. And I know that's a, the, the, the problematic term because it has New Age implications, but... That's a contemporary term. Christians need to reframe their consciousness as to who Christ really is. They see the average Christian still sees Christ wandering around in in what is akin to a bathrobe, um, um, you know, uh, cooking fish and uh, uh, you know, uh, wearing sandals, and that's what Christ did, and and that's how he appeared. And I'm not making fun of it when he was here in the first century. But, you know, Christ is not stuck in the first century. God is the God that is beyond space and time. God, Jesus, isn't stuck in the first century. So our perception of Jesus Christ should not be stuck in the first century. That's a symptom a symptom of having a brain that is atrophied, that's shrinking, brain cells that are that are stuck and shrinking. That, that's indicative of a 10% perception level. Christ isn't stuck in the first century. Christ is beyond space and time. He's beyond a billion centuries in the future. He's outside of the time continuum. He's beyond that. And therefore, if we would, we talk, the the word worship is constantly used in Christian circles. Well, we need to worship the Lord. People have no idea what it means to worship the Lord. What it doesn't mean, we don't come before the Lord uh, worshiping an idol. And and freeze framing our conception of Christ as a figure stuck in the first century is an idolatrous perception of who Jesus Christ is, and it's a denial of the totality of the totality of his of his lordship and the magnificence of his lordship. It's putting God in a box. That's an idol. And when you worship an idol, you 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 live under a curse. So you can you can have an idol that you call you know Jesus, but it's not the real Jesus of the Bible. So what people are worshiping for the most part is not the Jesus of the Bible. It's this 
artificial religious conception of who Jesus is that has nothing to do with real biblical truth, because real biblical truth tells us that Jesus is no longer stumbling around the first century, that he ascended into heaven, and heaven is a place that is outside of space and time, and that he's the king of kings and lord of uh, king of kings and lord of lords. And so he is so far beyond all of this. So if the if every individual believer would begin to worship Jesus as who he is versus stum- some figure stuck in the first century and they would allow their mind to be renewed by his word as it is really written, not passages that they've cherry picked from their uh, favorite Bible teachers, then they wouldn't be in a, uh, a state of spiritual retardation. I don't mean to be unkind, but I can't think of a better word. And then in that place of worship, as they come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, there is no fear. There is no victimization. There is no learned helplessness. And in that place of oneness with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, then there is the perfect understanding in the heart of every believer. There's the perfect understanding of what we are supposed to do in this time and this hour in terms of the righteous are bold as a lion and other verses. We weren't called to be shivering in fear and hiding. We're supposed to be advancing the kingdom of light and truth. So, it's it's a 180 degree shift in in belief system if people would live their lives as Jesus is lord but he really is lord it would completely revolutionize on a spiritual level everything we face and talk about and the very fabric and nature of America would be changed very radically and very quickly and beyond anybody's expectation it, there would be a there would be an overturning of the temporal rule of the kingdom of darkness in this nation. It would happen like lightning. There would be a complete destabilization of demonic infrastructures in the invisible realm, and there would be a bringing forth of God's purposes in our nation. And, you know, God isn't asleep. He's waiting on his people to to uh, step up to the plate. Okay. And the way you described... Jesus in terms of a contemporaneous figure as opposed to someone stuck in the uh, first century or, you know, I mean, that um, I I really have not heard anyone approach that subject like that. And and I think I think people need to understand that uh, uh, our God is, as you said, is beyond the space time continuum and uh you know outside of that box and outside of that particular um era and to consider him in or to to limit that uh uh to limit ourselves to to thinking of him in that fashion you're right is is idolatry so i mean this is fantastic in terms of gaining this understanding that we need to really embrace because there's so many on the forums, various forums on the internet. And I know people are listeners and, uh, you know, we go to various forums and, uh, look at the comments. My goodness, the comments are so reflective of a regressive, uh, if not, um, and I'll use your word, retarded, um, and not, um, uh, that's again, you know, that's not meant as a derisive term, uh, but 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 this re- retarded ideology of what, well, what really exists. So you, you're absolutely correct in all of this, um, and, and this is much bigger than people understand. Yeah, it goes to a bigger issue of people creating uh, a god of their own imagination rather than the god that right. is in the Bible. And explains right. himself exactly who he is, and the apostles explain it. And um, the New Old Testament is devoted to people uh, helping to understand who Jesus is and who he who he was in, on the earth, and who he uh, what happened to him, and, and what his uh, authority is now. And you know, we know that he not only was crucified so that all could be saved, but he took back the power over the death and the keys to hell uh, when that happened. And you know, the next thing the prophecy talks about is the end times, really, 
um, the things that happen in the end times. And we're seeing those things uh, happen today. The landscape, the countries are, are back in, in play, and uh, we have friction and, and chaos and turmoil in all these nations. Um, Paul, well, with, if I can just jump in here just for a second. I, I didn't mean to, I don't no, mean to right, knock you off your thought there. Uh, but, Paul, on Easter Sunday, um, Bill O'Reilly's based on his book uh, about Jesus, there was a movie uh, about the life of Jesus and killing Jesus, killing Jesus, and and, and having seen part of that, I just uh, it really, um, it really uh, angered me. I suppose anger is, is an emo- one of many emotions, but to portray Jesus in that film as someone who had no knowledge, at least the portrayal of no knowledge of who he was right up through uh, his baptism and, and having no knowledge of his divine purpose, or at least that was conveyed to the viewer. Um, the, the reason I brought this up is because it, it it just seems like this propaganda machine that's assailing all of Christianity, assailing um, uh, our Savior, assailing our beliefs, assailing the truth is just really ratcheted up and and combine that with what Joe just mentioned about the reconfiguration of the Middle East and the power structures and everything. It just seems like we are getting the the war against the believers. And and I I, I hate to even use the word Christianity, but the war against the believers um, is really being ratcheted up in a big way. Yeah, it is. And, and and here's the interesting thing um, regarding Bible prophecy and uh, the fact that the, the God of the Bible, uh, the personal living God of the universe, <clears throat> continually has chosen to speak to mankind through prophetic scriptures. And this is, of course, what separates the Bible from other uh, so-called religious books, so-called written by God because none of them contain any prophecies that ever came true. So you can you can list all the great religious books in the world, and the difference between them and the Bible is they don't contain any prophecies that ever came true. Zero. Okay, zero. So, they're, so they're, their scorecard is zero. And then you compare it with the Bible and the Old Testament prophecies and the New Testament prophecies, and you have thousands of prophecies that came true in precise detail. So... <laughs> So the score for the Old Testament and the New Testament is in excess of a thousand in comparison with the other religious books where it's zero or worse than that they contain prophecies that did not come true so it's in in the, in the negative so God has chosen over and over again to speak prophetically uh through his word he raises up prophets uh he speaks supernaturally through his prophets and he continually, over and over again, uh, beginning in Genesis, God speaks to mankind, uh, often thousands of years before an event happens, in precise detail. He says exactly what's going to be happened, what's going to happen, and then every one of those prophecies come to p- pass exactly as God supernaturally predicted. So Bible prophecy is the most pow- one of the most powerful tools that proves the truthfulness of God's word and Bible prophecy is also the means which God proves his supernatural reality because there because if you if you weren't biased against the scripture you would have to deal with the fact that there's no human explanation for the accuracy of all these prophecies that that have come true, like the virgin birth and Isaiah and uh, all the details about the the death and birth and resurrection of Christ and Isaiah and what happens to the Jewish people uh, is replete with prophecies in Jeremiah and Daniel and so on and so forth. And even the prophecies that the Old Testament patriarchs gave their sons, like Isaac and Jacob and so on and so forth, they came true, or the prophecies of what ha- happens to the, the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of uh, Isaac. Those all come true. So now we're in a time period where um, so many prophecies 
are coming true. One, we have the revived Roman Empire emerging that Daniel talked about, the coming global government, the coming one world economic system, and the coming world one world religion, which God announced quite clearly in the historical account of Babylon. And then he also repeated it again in the prophecies of Daniel, especially Daniel chapter 9. Um, and then God predicted that the Jews would be dispersed from Israel for a long period of time. And then in 2,000 years after being dispersed, they returned to the land in a spiritual condition of unbelief as prophesied by numerous prophets in the Old Testament. And then we have the prophecies you know, we turn on our television or whatever news media we watch, and we see nations like Russia, the Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Israel. Um, they dominate the evening news. But these are the nations that dominate uh, prophecies made 2,600 years ago or, or more. So we have Ezekiel 38, which is a precise outline of nations like Russia Ezekiel 38 talks over and over again about the Ukraine as being one of the key players in this uh, northern invasion of Israel. Persia or Iran is talked about in detail. And so many nations, uh, Turkey and, and uh, uh, all the nations in the news are all talked about in Ezekiel 38 in this coming war of Gog and Magog. And then you have uh, Elam, which I know you've had Bill Salas on the program, and I had the opportunity to interview him a bunch of times myself at the conference. Uh, he talks a lot about uh, Elam and Psalms 83 and the fact that God is speak supernaturally speaking to the Iranians with dreams and visions, and they're, they're coming to the Lord. And a lot of it revolves around the kingdom of Elam, which, is, uh, which was spoken of by Jeremiah the prophet also in Elam, and Persia or Iran were two separate kingdoms when those prophecies were made. So even though Elam currently exists in uh, Iran, and it's, place, it's the place where they have their nuclear reactor built, um, Elam, it, it, there's a prophecy regarding Elam. There's a prophecy regarding Syria in Psalm 83 that's different than Ezekiel 38. So, I mean, we, we go down the list and... and what is the statistical possibility that all the hot spots in the world right now that we read about every single day, it's where ISIS is, it's where terrorism is, it's where Babylon is, it's where the Garden of Eden is. You know, Iraq is key in Bible prophecy. Iran is huge in Bible prophecy. Russia or Rosh is huge in Bible prophecy. Um, the Ukraine is huge in prophecy. Turkey is huge in prophecy. Ethiopia, uh, Syria, and, and Elam, and so on and so forth. What are the statistical pro probabilities of a book containing prophecies that go back in excess of 2,600 years are giving the most accurate geopolitical depiction of what's happening in the world today? The, 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 what this is, this is to anybody who, who will take the blinders off their eyes, God is declaring his supernatural authorship and his, re, his reality. God is declaring his omniscience. God is declaring his ability to know the beginning uh, from the end. God is de declaring his existence before the entire world. Um, it, he's giving courtroom evidence in, in, in the courtroom of public opinion that's overwhelming that he exists, and then to finalize the proof of his uh, existence, we read one of the, some of the reasons for why, why God does this, why he, why he makes these very clear prophecies geopolitically, because you read after the Ezekiel 38-39 invasion of Russia and a consortium of uh, Middle Eastern nations. And by the way, I talk about this in my book, Mass Awakening. You read that God says at the end of Ezekiel 38 through the prophet Ezekiel that God supernaturally will destroy all these nations that are coming down to attack Israel. So that, for what? So that he will be glorified and magnified among the nations. So, so the Muslim peoples... And, and all the peoples in the world who have bothered to pay attention to whatever degree to Bible prophecy 
are going to have a uh, an object lesson that is very harsh and very much in their face when God supernaturally destroys the invaders of Israel supernaturally through earthquakes and hailstones, etc. Not only are they going to read how God predicted the conflict, but God will magnify himself among the nations. And I believe that means that there will be an incredible revival among the Islamic peoples as they see the God of the Bible uh, proving his reality uh, through the defense of Israel supernaturally and through the predictions. And the same thing occurs then in Psalm 83. So, uh, you know, we have this convergence of technology and now this convergence of a geopolitical theater and globalism and all these dynamics. And even if we're talking about uh, uh, genetics and DNA and uh, interspecies breeding and uh, the creation of super soldiers and uh, government brain mapping programs and so on and so forth, that's also predicted in the Bible. The entire genetic transhumanistic revolution, the entire scientific revolution that deals with cyborgs, androids, um, you know, the image of the beast, um, and transhumanism, that entire uh, uh, quadrant of, of super science, transhumanism in the singularity, is mentioned either directly or indirectly in the scripture because... Jesus Christ says these prophetic words, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Of course, Christ was specifically referring to the fallen angels mating with human women in Genesis 6, the Benai Elohim, that produced the race of Nephilim, a genetic merger between man and fallen angels. And these Nephilim, or Rephaim, are going to return in the last days, and they're returning in the very time that we live in. So God is not asleep, and again, God, uh, I want to just revisit this. God is, Jesus Christ is not stuck in the first century walking around in a bathrobe with sandals talking to fishermen. And I'm not diminishing the sacred and holy ministry of Jesus Christ when he did choose to walk around in a robe and sandals. I'm not making fun of that because that would be blasphemous. What I am doing is making fun of the mindset that fails to perceive the truth that Jesus Christ is no longer frozen in time in the first century. And the, the biblical rationale or, or basis for that uh, uh, strike against a false theological paradigm is based on the teaching of Jesus Christ. He rebuked the Pharisees in their time. Jesus rebuked the religious leaders in their time for their failure to perceive that he was the Messiah. He rebuked the Pharisees for their failure to recognize that they did not recognize the hour of their visitation by God because they were frozen in time. So obviously I'm not Jesus Christ, but I am rebuking uh, or exhorting or challenging the, the present evangelical paradigm, uh, Protestant Catholic paradigm of religious consciousness, which refuses to, to take down the idol of Jesus stuck in the first century and worship him as the great I am that I am. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's ascended into heaven. He rules and reigns the universe, he is outside of space and time, and being outside of space and time, he can't be frozen in the first century feeding fishermen, because he's now outside of space and time. And not only that, his infinite intelligence created the genetic code, foresaw the advent of transhumanism. His infinite intelligence foresaw and foreknew the nanochip and the DNA implants of the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, and the technology that that makes reference to. And Jesus Christ also foreknew, even when he was walking around with sandals and a robe, he foreknew the transhumanist revolution because he referred directly in prophecy that as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, referring to the Nephilim, or fallen angels, fallen angels mating with human women. You know, as you say that, or as you have spoke those words, 
And Joe mentioned this earlier, thinking back at the Drudge headline, the Tech Titans defy, to defy death. There's, a, there's uh, actually a new one today uh, right there at the top. First person who will live to be a thousand years old already alive. It, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the people like the... Um, uh, the, the billionaires or multimillionaires of the heads of Google and uh, uh, the Ray Kurzweil's of the world. I mean, don't these people, what are these people thinking? Or what is, uh, I mean, are they all demonically, uh, do they all have a demonic uh, uh, bias or uh, infiltration? I mean, don't they read the Bible? Or or, or is this a conscious uh, um a conscious method of attempting to outdo God. I mean, what's what's at play here with these people? Well, I, I talk about Kurzweil in this whole transhumanist revolution in detail in Mass Awakening because it's because it's it's a huge part of what's going on in our society. And I don't fault anybody for uh, paying attention to nutrition, nutrition, cutting edge vitamins and other technologies to extend their life, et cetera. I mean, I could talk, I'm not an expert in the area, but there's all kinds of nutrients that are inexpensive that people could be taking that would improve their brain health and their cardiovascular health and keep them from getting cancer and create life extension. So I'm not, I'm not against that per se. But there is a false understanding here. I mean, Kurzweil and these other transhumanists uh, claim to be multidimensional thinkers, but they, their prejudice and their bias blinds them from seeing the most important dimension of all into the future. And purely on a scientific basis, their analysis regarding achieving immortality and life extension and their analysis as to why we age and die <clears throat> and get sick is faulty and one-dimensional because they have a scientific bias against a higher truth, a higher order of dimensionality than what they talk about in their science. And what I'm specifically referencing is, yeah, mankind, every one of us, are in the process of dying, and they're correct. The process of dying is coded into each one of our DNA codes. So when they attempt to get into the DNA and rewrite the coding and uh, add uh, technology and science and uh, uh, genetic modification into the mix in an attempt to uh, extend life or create artificial immortality, by uploading our consciousness into a cyborg or an android or whatever, um, they're they're partially right in the sense that yeah, the, the DNA uh, is coded in such a way that we die, we deteriorate, and uh, we we get diseases. But they don't understand how the DNA, and I talk about this in Mass Awakening, got coded that way, and it got coded that way because. Mankind didn't come here through an evolutionary accident. So, they're, so they're, they're, their foundational premise as to the origins of mankind is faulty. They think we came here by evolutionary random chance over billions of years. That's a false paradigm. We came here because an omnipotent God created an original man and an original woman named Adam and Eve. And we, all, we all originate from their DNA. We all come from uh, a, a real great-great-great-great-grandmother and a great-great-great-grandfather, Adam and Eve. And we all have their, D- our, their DNA in us. Now, they were given their DNA by God. So Adam and Eve were given the DNA of God. That's why when God said, let us make man in our own image, that meant a bunch of things. But it also meant God imparted in Adam and Eve the DNA of God, which when he first created Adam and Eve, the coding in the DNA of Adam and Eve allowed for uh, them to be a perfect age, perfect health, no disease, no death, no depression, no, ex- no anxiety, no degradation whatsoever of the human condition. They live forever in paradise. In fact, the natural world was also coded at a very high level where everything was paradise. 
But the root cause of the degradation of the DNA and the environment, the root cause, if they weren't biased against it, is multidimensional. What occurred was a violation of a law in a dimension beyond time and space that they don't acknowledge exists, which is, for lack of a better word, the invisible world, the spiritual dimension, perhaps the fourth dimension, but it's an, uh, it's an other dimensional reality where the, where the problem existed. So the DNA was recoded. It was recoded by the death force, which reprogrammed the DNA in Adam and Eve, which caused an immediate loss of the consciousness and relationship with God. It created the death force in their bodies and their personalities. They, They had fear, and they activated by rejecting God's word, by rejecting God's word, because God's word, Jesus is the word become flesh, the word of God, who is God, was the coding mechanism, if you will, uh, for their DNA. But when they separated themselves from their coding mechanism, which was not just the mechanism, it's, it's the person, Jesus is the word become flesh, they, they degraded and they activated the law of sin and death, and it is the law of sin and death which was activated in a different dimension but plays itself out in this physical dimension which causes every man and woman to deteriorate, get disease, and die. That is the root cause of death, disease, and dying. So when through, through uh, transhumanism and Kurzweil's theories and the transhumanists and the singularity and androids and cyborgs, these are all artificial attempts at immortality. It, the, the attempt is to create an artificial heaven and to make man artificial gods. But Here's where the rubber meets the road, and this is where Christians need to get on the right road and get off the road of religion. Where the rubber meets the road is extra-dimensional, and where the rubber meets the road is this. Christianity is truth and not a religion. As long as people who say themselves Christian, are Christians perceive themselves as being religious, they are going to be ineffective in dealing with anything and they're on the wrong road. The way they get on the right road, and Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, is to recognize that Christianity is truth and not a religion. Christianity is truth and not a religion. Therefore, at the higher dimension, which is the causality for the degradation of every man and woman, at the higher level, Artificial immortality through technology and cyborgs and androids and robots uploading human consciousness, uh, genetic uh, redesign by human beings or interspecies uh, interbreeding by human beings, transhumanism and all that science and technology collides with the truth of the coding of God's universe. It doesn't collide with religion. It collides with Christianity as truth and not religion. So the the transhumanist philosophy is ultimately non-truth. Transhumanist philosophy, which seeks to achieve immortality through um, technology and science, is in itself a false religious paradigm, which is non-true, and it's illusory. And as a non-truth, it's going to collide in an extra dimension with the truth and reality of not only God's existence and the lordship of Jesus Christ of all things, but it's going to collide with the reality that it is God Almighty, the great I Am, who created the coding system. He is the source of life itself because life is more than man being a biological machine. Every baby is born with a soul in it that's eternal. And so transhumanism is going to come into a head-on collision with the finality of truth, which exists apart from whether or not people believe in it or whether or not Christians uh, grasp it. And when it collides with truth, it's going to disintegrate. It's going to fail. And you and I, uh, if we live long enough, will see the implosion of transhumanism. At the very least, transhumanism will not produce godhood. 
it will produce a generation of Frankensteins. Okay. Would you not say then, um, just so I'm clear on this and our audience is clear on this, with respect to the lineage of, and I'll use this terminology, forgive me if this is not correct, but the lineage of God through Adam and Eve, the seed of Adam and Eve, as we go down through the generations, um, there's that parallel, if you will, lineage. Uh, when I say parallel, I'm originating from the the fallen ones, the Nephilim, and creating the Rephaim, perhaps, or the uh, men of renown, the giants, and the hybrids of the mating between the Nephilim or the fallen ones and the human women. There's that parallel um, uh, lineage that was destroyed by God at the time of the flood. Um, and somehow we, we've seen the resurgence of that, uh, Nimrod and, and, and so on. And this transhumanist agenda is attempting to recreate that very lineage to achieve immortality um, uh, uh, and, to, and to short circuit the DNA of the uh, of, of, of Adam and Eve to short circuit that for the purpose of becoming god pharaoh king type entities that have this um belief of immortality to to say hey you know what uh god we can we can be like you i suppose and and i don't mean to in any way shape or form be blasphemous here but that i'm just thinking what they're they are you know try, trying to put in place what they're thinking here isn't this what we're seeing today? I mean, this this parallel um, lineage or this attempt by these crazy people to short circuit the seed of Adam, the seed of uh, um, well, the seed of Adam, I suppose, to achieve immor immor uh, immortality and uh, be like God Pharaoh kings. Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's interesting that when you go back to Genesis, um, you know, God gives these uh, um, these accounts of genealogy that, that that almost like bore you to death. You know, so and so begat so and so, who begat so and so, who begat so and so, and for years, I mean, it's like I could barely read it without dying. <laughs> and then I realized <laughs> that God is it's a pre precise DNA uh, genealogical account. And it also traces the, the 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 seed of the Messiah, and you know, c c coming through David and so on and so forth. So um, that's going on. And then, yes, you're right. You have this uh, when the fallen angels. You you have several forces come into play here, and I I talk about the science and the spirituality of it in detail in Mass Awakening. So it's hard to do it briefly, but I'm going to try. You have several forces. Uh, coming into play here first of all you have uh men like kurzweil <clears throat> um and, and i'm making an assumption about him i don't know him personally so i don't know if it's an accurate assumption but based on his science i would assume uh he has not received jesus christ as his lord and savior so you have a whole bunch of these contemporary scientists and technology people uh that that they're they're as biological machines they're alive and they have a energy force in them which is their human spirit which is driving the biological machine that they live in but even though they have an energy force which is a human spirit which is driving the biological machine and brain that they live in they are spiritually dead so they're on, on one level on the biological level well, let's look at that in multidimensional terms. On on many dimensions, the scientists and the technology people <clears throat> who do not who have not been born again, uh, they are being energized and driven by their human spirits. But their human spirits are only alive in a limited number of dimensions. So they have a limited dimension, dimensionality 
in terms of, of their aliveness. Because the, the Bible, which is true truth, final reality, Christianity is truth and not a religion, says that um, when, when men, uh, because of the fall of Adam and Eve, they're dead in their, tr- their trespasses and sins. So that every man and Eve, I mean, every man and woman born from uh, Adam and Eve, which is all of us, were born spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. So these scientists are on several levels alive spiritually, not spiritually, uh, uh, physically alive, but they're not spiritually alive. So they're not alive in their full dimensionality because that can only happen when they invite Christ in their life and are born again. And it's only through the Spirit of God coming into the inner man or woman and when that Spirit of God regenerates a man or woman, they become born again. And so the dead human spirit, which is governing the consciousness of these scientists and the transhuman, transhumanist movement, they can think intellectually, but they're being governed by a dead human spirit because their spirit has not been regenerated. It has not been made born again. You can only be born again when Jesus Christ comes into your uh, inner man, and you're regenerated by the Spirit of God. You're born again. You become spiritually alive. Now, going back to the scripture which I've mentioned before, the Bible says, for example, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Well, that that illustrates to us, when it says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, it illustrates to us that <clears throat> the human brain is driven by a spirit, it can be a born-again spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, where it's regenerated. That born-again spirit can be prey to influence from a spirit of fear. Or worse yet, the spirit of man can actually be dead, although biologically alive. So as they construct their science, uh, and as they try to do genetic breeding, for example, with uh, in- interspecies breeding with Nephilim, or Rephium DNA, where they're secretly tinkering in laboratories and genetically uh, interbreeding Nephilim DNA or fallen angel DNA with human DNA, they're doing so from a mind which is biologically alive but spiritually dead. And because their minds are spiritually dead, they cannot see the obvious. They cannot see reality as reality. They see an illusion of reality because they are in darkness, and darkness is is an illusion of reality. Full reality, full dimension, full dimensionality, is only available to those people who have been regenerated by the Spirit of God. Only those people have access to the fullness of reality. The people who have not received the Spirit of life are limited to darkness, so it's a very limited range of reality. So, uh, when when they tinker with the interbreeding uh, with the fallen angel DNA and the human DNA, and this is why at the very highest level you have Luciferianism in the scientific elite, because when you're fallen and you're dead spiritually, you you worship the spirit of this age, which is Lucifer, and with the interspecies breeding, when you have a fallen angel mating with a human woman, you have a biological person, so to speak, being born, but that person, this is the terrifying part, is soulless. And not only are they soulless, they're so soulless that they could never be born again. Because when you have the DNA of a fallen angel and the DNA of a man or a woman being interbred, not only are they born without a human soul, which is absolutely terrifying, but because they're born without a human soul, there's no possibility for them to be born again or redeemed. It, it, they are the damned. They're biologically alive, but they are they are like the fallen angels. There's no possibility of redemption. And that's terrifying. <laughs> terrifying indeed. Um, it, 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 they're, they're artificial creations, I, I suppose, is the... Uh, I mean, yeah. they might have the Homo sapien characteristics to some extent, um, or 
origins from Homo sapiens, uh, uh, at least partially. But uh, okay, I, 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 I'm getting this. Yeah, and, <laughs> and this. Now, wow. Go ahead. Here's another. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, Paul. Go ahead and. Uh, uh, so here's the interesting thing. So Jesus, of course, knows about this before it happens because he gives us that prophecy, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, as it was in the days of Lot, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And I think in the days of Lot, <clears throat> that's a far deeper story than the average Christian gets. I think it has everything to do with, in fact, I know it has <laughs> the central thrust of as it was in the days of Lot I mean, as it was in, in, in as it was in the days, the days of Lot, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The central thrust is not homosexuality. So you have all these Christians who 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 you know they they have arbitrarily defined homosexuality as the ultimate sin. Now let's really tear apart the story of Lot layer by layer and see what it's really talking about. Okay. It's 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 much more akin to the days of Noah, because what you had there was a number of things. First of all, two of God's angels were sent into the city to get Lot out <clears throat> and his wife and his family, because Abraham was an intercessory prayer for Lot, and because of Abraham's intercessory prayers, God sent angels in to Lot to rescue. Uh, excuse me, to, into Sodom to rescue Lot. Now, what happened there? Was this a matter of homosexuality, as as uh, that you know was basically the essential mantra of the evangelical church? Well, no, it's not any longer because the evangelical church has uh, <laughs> redefined sexuality completely. But it, it was the mantra of the evangelical church 20 years ago. But what really happened? What really happened was is that the men of Sodom, this was not just about the rape of men, of men raping men. This is really about men raping angels. The reason that the lust factor was so high among the men of Sodom was not because they had, quote, forgive the vulgarity, I won't even say the vulgarity, but 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 the, it wasn't because oh gee here's some new guys and we want to rape them. That's not what the story's about. The men of Sodom understood that these were angels, and their desire was to rape the angels, which was really about having sex with angels because um, Sodom and Gomorrah were cultures where. Uh, sex between human beings and angels were common. So this is really a story, uh, if you get into critical focus, about men wanting to rape angels. It's about human angelic sex. Now, people say, okay, you know, this is all about male homosexuality. Well, no, it's not, because we just discovered what it was really all about. And then we have a, a troublesome verse which is always ignored. It says, it says that all the people of Sodom gathered around to watch the rape of the angels. All the people, all the people. That means all the women were involved as well as the men. So if all the women were involved, this is far more than uh, a homosexual a definition because – the women were there. Why were the women there? The, the women were there because they wanted to watch. They wanted to be sexually entertained by watching the rape of angels. That's how heavy this story of Lot really is when you take it out of its uh, you know, Sunday school application. So you have Jesus Christ referring to two cases, the days of Lot and the days of Noah, which both involve angelic sex with human beings, specifically in one case, it's God's angels who they attempt to rape. And in the other cases, in both Sodom and Gomorrah and in the time of Noah, uh, the fallen angels were uh, mating with human women. So so uh, fallen angels mating with human women was a characteristic of all of these cultures. And Jesus Christ says it's going to happen again 
big time, of course I'm paraphrasing, before the return of the Lord. So, so the fact that they're doing genetic experimentation and creating super soldiers and, and very likely have Nephilim DNA being interbred with human DNA tells us that we're in close proximity to the return of Jesus Christ and that this experimentation of uh, Nephilim DNA and human DNA is going to create soulless people or soulless super beings that will, because they're soulless, they're under complete demonic control and their their total consuming desire will be to, to strike, to devour, to destroy the children of God. It will be a demonic army that will be an in, insatiable lust to destroy the children of God. Now, that's why this only goes on. It's a trigger point, and it only goes on for a short period of time because God is going to say rather quickly, once it erupts, enough is enough. So when we read the account of Armageddon, we see all these very, very strange creatures on the battlefield that are not obviously not human beings. These these strange creatures inhabit the battlefields of Armageddon, and they are sentenced into the bottomless pit very quickly. So God, who is beyond space and time, he sees this as such a threat against his order, these soulless creatures, that when the prophecy of Christ is fulfilled, it's going to begin, I believe, a very accelerated countdown to the return of Jesus Christ and to, and to the total destruction of these creatures and Armageddon. Wow. Paul, we're at the uh, top of the hour break. We're going to take that now. Uh, very well how you brought that back around and uh, differentiated and explained how you know the days of Noah and the days of Lot, both referenced, as you said, by Jesus, uh, would be what we see in these end times. And I would urge all people to go back and read those scriptures and read through those accounts and, and uh, you know, pray on that and ask the Lord for uh, revelation on that if you're having uh, any trouble following or, or understanding. With that, we're going to go to our, our break. Into our third and final hour this Wednesday, April 15, 2015. Uh, today, our guest is Mr. Paul McGuire. He is a, a prolific author and has such a well uh, such a great background, a very vast, uh, being a commentator from Fox News to CNN, a fil- f- feature film producer, uh, previously the host of his own radio show, The McGuire Report, and goes around and, and does a fantastic job speaking uh, to live audiences at conferences and TV interviews and, and radio interviews such as this, speaking on uh, what he has seen in his lifetime and, and his experiences that he puts together in the book. Paul, I want to ask you, your new book, Mass Awakening, um, is there anything when you were writing this book that you learned that you had not heard or, or uh, something that you really, your favorite part of this book, putting this together? Well, I have to, uh, there's the, probably a difference between what I learned <clears throat> and the favorite yeah. part of the book, um, I as as I got the book um, fairly well done, uh, the Lord dealt with me before I completed with it. But completed it. That's part of the reason why it came out <clears throat> uh, late, <laughs> which I apologize for. Um, but the Lord convicted me, as He has so often on these uh, issues. The, the, the conviction is really kind of always in the same thing. The Lord said, uh, you know, you need to, sp-, He said, not in an audible voice, but He said, Paul, you need to spend more time equipping my people how to live victoriously in the last days with real truth from my word, not just, you know, little cliches, but you really need to, to, to build up my people, edify them, and teach them how to walk in the supernatural power of God and, and to really lay hold of the promises of God by faith and walk in victory. You really need to impart that into them. And so that was the favorite part of my book because the, the because there's a lot of chapters, a lot of chapters at the end of the book, and I'm not talking about just a few pages, there's a lot, about the supernatural joy of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit and the purpose of the body of Christ and, and all that kind of stuff. So that was my favorite part because after the tough sledding of all the you know, tough stuff that we dealt with, I, you know, as you guys know, when you write on this stuff, 
you get ministered to. So I got blessed and ministered to by the Lord as I as I made myself available to to minister to God's people. Wow, that that's that's fantastic, and, and I, I really uh, learned myself learned a lot from uh, well the, the entirety of your book, but in particular, which you mentioned, equipping yourself to to fight. Um, the supernatural, the, the supernatural fight in which we find ourselves, and will find ourselves in the future. I learned a lot about the um, about how to do it. I mean, it's um, things that I had not considered before. You really open up a another dimension, I suppose, pun intended there, um, in terms of how to deal with what's coming. And what's coming is going to be ugly. It's going to be, it's going to be just uh, really rough. It, as rough as it was, I'm sure for you to write it, it's going to be rough to live it. But you also have that hope and that uh, hope through education and instruction. And I thought that was just brilliant the way you, you, you laid that out there. And it's it's so important. It's so important for people to realize that we have the we're fighting from a position of victory. Uh, at least in yeah, in, yeah. In yeah. So yeah, I, and, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I I, I was done. I uh, I was done. Go ahead. Well, yeah, right. I mean, we're fighting from a position of, of victory, and uh, um, I was when I used to do my early YouTubes. When I say early YouTubes, time flies by so fast that early YouTubes, which seemed like five minutes ago, are now. 12 years ago, but I used to do them all up in uh, uh, Malibu, on the cliffs of Malibu with the Pacific Ocean behind me. I did a ton of them. Uh, Not all of them are up there because I I took some down by accident. I can't find them. But anyway, we went up to Malibu Canyon two days ago to shoot uh, some video uh, because it was a clear day with the Pacific Ocean behind us. And, you know, I was talking about mass awakening and all that stuff and ISIS and uh, the, 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 the crisis events facing America. And to my surprise, and this always happens to my surprise because it's not something you can plan on, uh, about 20 minutes into the message, and that message is up on YouTube, by the way, and, and you guys can link it to your uh uh, site. Okay. Okay. I think it's called Mass. It's called Paul McGuire Mass Awakening, and it's a picture of me in a blue shirt with the, the Malibu cliffs in the ocean. Okay. So I'm trying to get the whole thing up there. I'm having a technical problem, but at least I got ten very important minutes. So the the anointing of the Lord uh, came upon me about uh, twenty minutes in, and I have some of that about ten minutes of that up there. Where, where, you know, you prepare something to say, and all of a sudden God infuses your words with supernatural power and an anointing from the Holy Spirit that you know is not you, you know? Right. You know when it's you, and you know when the Lord is moving through you. And I was surprised by the power of the Holy Spirit that came through me. It was like a surge of power and it produced hope, it produces hope and it builds faith and there's a, a supernatural confidence uh that is imparted that I believe is from the Lord and that's in that's in the book and I and the only reason I'm talking about it is because you know there's other messages I put up on YouTube or whatever and it's good teaching and good information but you know you can't plan on the Lord showing up and he showed up, and, and I think it will. I think it will strongly lift people's faith up. Okay, all right, fantastic. Well, you know, since you mentioned um, when you were out there, you mentioned ISIS. You state that uh, obviously America becoming very dangerous, especially now. We've got ISIS, and, and as I rattled off at the beginning of the program the various threats that we that we face um and, and it's interesting because you're right here the the very same mechanisms designed to protect us can easily become the mecha- mechanisms to enslave us and i think that's exactly what's happening um so, so uh, um 
you know, we just learned, um, and as you pointed out at the beginning of the show and on your uh, on your website, that's PaulMcGuire.us, folks. That's PaulMcGuire.us. It's linked off of HagmanHagman.com prominently. Um, but uh, do you do you expect, Paul? I mean, I mean, we're seeing this resurgence of Islam, and I guess this is a. This is more than just ISIS on our on our borders on the southern borders because I think that's kind of old news to a lot of us. Uh, we, we've had Al Qaeda and their offshoots there for for some time and, and camps throughout the United States. But uh, what what really bothers me is this um, this fundamental change within our country. Yes, we've got the threat of ISIS. Yes, we've got the threat of nuclear or pandemic or, or you know whatever threat there might be to the, uh, uh, the on a terrorist level it seems to me that perhaps an even more insidious threat is this the fundamental changing of our country of our laws of our culture of our belief systems that is very pervasive throughout the Culture and judicial system, and um, well, every aspect of American society that, that's taking place right now. I mean, twenty years ago, I, I can't imagine anyone twenty years ago, except those elite members, would ever believe that we would be looking at changing our democratic laws to accommodate Sharia law uh, here in America, or the elevation of the Muslim Brotherhood and Islam to the extent it has been. So, I mean, we're captured from within. We've been an infiltrated, invaded, and subjugated in the process of being subjugated by by Islam. And I think Islam, in connection with communism, is going to be the um, the mechanism to usher in and to um, control the New World Order. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it certainly appears like communism or radical Marxism has made a partnership <clears throat> with uh, radical Islam because they're they're working hand in hand with one another. I mean, I would imagine that that uh, when the day is done <clears throat> after they finish their conquest, they'll fight it out between one another. But for the time being, they're working hand in hand, and. Uh, the, the danger here is that um, um, because of the infiltration and the infiltration with huge sums of money, um, we have Islam as a preferred special status religion way over Christianity. In other words, you can turn on the news any week in America and see religious persecution and censorship of of all kinds of activities that the Constitution clearly protects by schools and uh, civic organizations and communities, etc., where the, the rights of Christians to peacefully and lovingly practice the Christian religion is under assault and being made illegal. But at the same time, uh, if somebody of the Muslim faith, that they, they are promoted to a special status. I mean, you have people... Uh, principles independently and, and huge numbers of people you know um, uh, leading Islamic prayers over the sound system of schools well th they don't allow the Bible to be read so Islam which is a tiny minority which is growing uh, is spreading itself and enjoying all kinds of special protections whereas Christianity and Judaism is under attack all out attack so um, what we ha what we have here is, uh, as you said, our nation is being redesigned from within, and um, we see a very very fast erosion, censorship, uh, attack, a chopping away of all Christian uh, religious, formally constitutionally protected liberties, and if we don't wake up soon, we're going to lose everything um and because it's being taken away from us now um when you know a people do not stand up 
lovingly and peacefully and most of all intelligently. And I have to emphasize intelligently because great harm can be done if you stand up unintelligently and, you know, violate the law. So I'm talking about peaceful, loving, but intelligent, strategic, standing up for your uh, Christian liberties and rights, which the Constitution guaranteed you, but it's being stolen from you. We're going to wake up in, in three years with no religious liberties whatsoever. You know, I mean, none, zero. People don't, don't really need, the light bulb needs to turn on. Uh, with the computer technology that's currently out there, don't think for a moment that kids that don't that come from Christian households and adults that that profess the Christian faith, to, and that would include all these people who think that they're safe in the seeker-friendly churches. They think that by cl- placating the system, they're being left alone. They're not being left alone. They're they're being uh, uh, categorized also. You know how many jobs? How many people are not being hired? and not being promoted into better jobs and upper echelon jobs and certain categories of jobs, especially in the public sector. They're not getting jobs. Uh, They're being discriminated against, uh, Christian children, Christian adults, and they don't realize why. And the real reason why is that they've been profiled through computer technology as being Christians, and there's a discrimination and a non-hiring policy, especially in upper-paying, upper-echelon jobs, and this would be affect every spectrum of our society. So what's happening as we speak is Christians are going to end up getting the lower-level jobs, and um, it doesn't matter about their uh, level of education because they're going to get persecuted. And if, if people don't stand up and deal with it now while they still have the opportunity to deal with it, it's going to be very very ugly and horrible soon. No, I, I, I totally agree with you on that. And, and you know, um, much like the uh, story of Sodom and Gomorrah has been, um, I mean, the real story, as you mentioned and described, um, has, has been avoided. Uh, I, I think the story and maybe this is an improper improper analogy, but you know the Lois Lerner story of the IRS, the Hillary Clinton emails that were expunged, erased, or supposedly erased. I I believe in my research that we're looking at a Christian a Christian component Christianity, um, a very significant Christian component to this certainly conservative, with respect to the IRS, conservative, uh, politically conservative groups were targeted. But I also believe that there's the the, the real, um, the dirty little secret there, I believe, involves the faith groups, the Christian groups, the the real Christian groups out there. Um, At least that's what I believe. Now, I I, I could be wrong. I've, I've talked to some people about the uh, the content or what they believe reasonably sure of the content based on their positions and in both cases I suspect that there's more to it than that so yeah the, the we as followers of the true church I believe are the are the targets and we've got the the crosshairs on the back of our heads and I think you're right. I think they were, we, we're going to be subjugated to such an extent that it's going to be impossible. And, and I can see that. I can see the mechanisms already working. They're already in place to to subjugate the um, the undesirables in whatever class we might fall or whatever uh, whatever characteristics that, that might include. It, it's already the infrastructure is already there, and, and and I believe it's in play. But, um, you know, regarding uh, religious liberty and Christian liberties, or even the, the, the irony is is that uh, Judaism in America, um, Judaism in America is not uh, one monolithic belief system. You have the secular atheistic uh, Jews. You have the uh, uh, traditional Jews, conservative Jews. So it's not a monolithic group, as some people would, would suggest. Um, 
but the more conservative Jews are also uh, a, a target. More uh, Mormons that are conservative would be a target. Catholics, Catholics who who hold to traditional uh, Catholic beliefs, not the, the the beliefs of the current Pope, uh, they represent an astronomical number of people, and uh, they are going to be a, a target. So, um, at, at the present moment, there there exists an opportunity uh, for now uh, for people to legally and law-abiding and peacefully and strategically stand up and regain their rights. Because at this present moment, at least for this moment, uh, there exists an opportunity for a significant amount of those rights to be strengthened and to be regained. But this is the final hour. And if this time is not seized legally to do that, the time is coming, it's around the, it's it's like in striking distance when the door will be shut and it will be too late. So we are literally, in terms of religious freedoms and what uh, life in America will be like for people of faith, uh, this is the defining moment. I mean, it's right now. And so um, if people would take an intelligent, strategic stand and and understand that they can still make a difference, at least at this time, I believe to to whatever degree, let's say it's 30 percent, 35 percent. I'm being conservative. Let's say you can re, uh, retain religious freedoms by 35 percent. Um, and the the, the 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 opportunity to practice your Christian faith or conservative Jewish faith or whatever Catholic faith by 35 percent. If you can strengthen that by participating now, that's a huge percentage of uh, freedom you're preserving. But it has to be done now. And so you know the question has to be asked. And this uh, I'm really asking to all all of your um, listeners. They all know, they, every person listening to your program has a sphere of influence. They know a lot of people who, who, who um, you know, may not be in sync with everything we're talking about, but they would consider themselves traditional, let's say, Catholics or traditional Christians or traditional Jews with a conservative bent. They all have a sphere of influence that they can talk to and reason and influence these people. Uh, if they talk to them and influence them, them and use their, their God-given ability to persuade them to, to get in the game, we have an opportunity of preserving freedom. But if we maintain the status quo, and that status quo is being led by a nefarious band of traitors, uh, which would be the Christian leadership of the uh, uh, churches that are selling us down the river, and, and they know who they are, they speak up on nothing. They 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 never take a stand for Christian liberty. Uh, they appease. They gave in. They pervert. They make alliances with the enemies of the gospel. And uh, th- those people are the ones that ultimately will do more to take away our freedoms than any other group. So if people would use their sphere of influence, I'm not talking about screaming and yelling and writing nasty emails to people. That's completely counterproductive. If they were willing to take a stand, great, great good could be done, and and there could be hope for the future. And this is where it's simply a matter of rolling up your sleeves, hard work, practical obedience. Absolutely, and um, let's talk about the the obedience, the, the faith versus and uh, the obedience. So often today in churches, we see uh, if you find a a church that teaches a, a message which brings conviction, um, then that's, you know, a a church that's ahead of 90% of the Christian, quote-unquote, Christian churches out there. Uh, How important is it not only to, uh, you know, state that we are believers and and saved by uh, Jesus Christ through our faith and through his grace, but how important is it to be obedient and not only to to talk about what the Lord, uh, how he wants us to be, but to to behave, you know, uh, in that way also? Well, it's everything, and it's a, it's a very good question, and it's not a, obviously not a popular question. But 
every person who says they believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, um, that those are people who, who I guess would call themselves believers in Jesus Christ or followers of Jesus Christ. But Jesus in his own teachings makes a very clear distinction between those that are following him kind of from a distance and are are naming his name as Lord, but in, in, in the practice of their daily lives, uh, they are not allowing him to be Lord of all of their life, and they're not really serving Jesus, and they're not true disciples of Jesus. So you have a lot of people who say they're Christians and say they're saved, but you have a much smaller uh, minority of people who are disciples of Christ who who have invited Christ to be Lord of their life. You know, I remember um, <clears throat> it was about a year and a half after I was saved, miraculously hitchhiking on the back roads of Missouri. I went to Manhattan, uh, New York, and uh, I went to a church, and I heard a Baptist minister um, in Manhattan preach a sermon where he he preached something to the effect of, you know, are you just going to be saved or are you going to invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life? And I was convicted by the Holy Spirit that I had not yet invited Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life. So I prayed a prayer in that church and invited Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life. And I knew at that moment that I had made Jesus Lord of my life, that he was no longer just my Savior, he was my Lord. Now, I don't have I don't have in and of myself the power um, humanly or the will humanly to keep that uh, uh, covenant with God, to walk with him as Lord. But when I surrendered my life in an act of faith and invited Jesus Christ to be Lord, Jesus backed it up with the power of his spirit. And that doesn't mean I've done it perfectly, but Jesus is still Lord of my life, you know, 40 years later. 40 years later, Jesus Christ is still Lord of my life. And what that has meant on countless occasions, uh, more occasions more occasions than I can possibly count, is I'm confronted with a choice. Am I going to do something to protect my own personal peace and prosperity and comfort? Or am I going to take up my cross and obey Jesus? Am I going to, am I going to just cop out and protect my own posterior? Or am I going to obey the Lord? And um, I haven't done it perfectly, but I can tell you with a clear conscience that Jesus is still Lord. And when push comes to shove through the power of his Holy Spirit, I do, in, in, in real life, pick up my cross and follow Jesus and obey him. And I, and I know many of your listeners do, too. So it's it's in that place where you make Jesus Lord of your life. It, you know, people... People want to know, well, gee, how do I experience a closeness with God? How do I experience his joy and his peace? How do I see miracles? How come I'm not seeing answers to prayer? How come I'm not seeing the supernatural? How come God isn't using me in in dynamic ways? How come I don't see miraculous provision? Uh, How come I don't see you know, the reality of God in my life? He's, He's like distance, and I don't see any prayers answered. Well, a lot of it may have to do with the fact that you, you know, the question is, are you following Jesus kind of like from afar? He's your Savior, or have you have you bent your knees and heart and invited Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life, and have you chosen with an act of your will to pick up your cross and follow Jesus? Because if you have, if you have made that decision, to invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life and pick up your cross and follow Jesus and obey his voice when it's not comfortable, you will experience the supernatural power and the joy. You will see miracles. You will hear God's voice. You will experience a supernatural walk with God because there can no there can be no real supernatural power and no supernatural walk with God without making Jesus Lord of your life and picking up your cross and following Jesus. And then finally, every believer in Jesus Christ, and I never hear this preached in churches. I do hear it preached from prophecy teachers, but I never hear it preached in, church, uh, preached in churches. The Bible very clearly tells us that every believer in Jesus Christ 
is going to stand before what is called the uh, the judgment seat of Christ, where every believer in Jesus Christ is going to give an account to Jesus of what they did in their lives at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, they're guaranteed entrance into heaven by faith, so I'm not inserting a works-oriented gospel here, but even though they're guaranteed entrance into, faith, uh, entrance into heaven by faith and faith alone, Every believer, that includes me and you and everybody listening, is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And according to the Bible, that at the judgment seat of Christ, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That means people are going to be sobbing intensely. They're going to be crying with convulsions because everything they've done is going to be manifest before the Lord. All the stuff that they did for themselves to cover their own posteriors, to play it safe, is going to burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. And it's going to be a purifying fire of the Holy Spirit. This girl emailed me. I was just stunned when she emailed me. Where does it say fire in the Holy Spirit? (sighs) It says fire all over the Bible. Read it for crying out loud. Because Jesus said the fire, like a fire, the Spirit of God is going to come upon every believer at the judgment seat of Christ, and every single thing that they did, uh, that they did for self, and covering their posterior, and not obeying God, or for vanity, or glory, or pride, or lust, or selfishness, or whatever, it's going to be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble, and it's going to be an agonizing experience as the fire of God comes upon your life. It's going to be agonizing. Yet, Jesus says, because they put their faith in him, they are guaranteed an uh, entrance into heaven. So even though they go through this fire where the wood, hay, and stubble is burnt up, they will be like a person who escaped from a burning house. Jesus will still save them, and they still will enter heaven. And then the, uh, the good part about the judgment seat of Christ is at the judgment seat of Christ, and this is before you get into heaven, Jesus will reward you for everything that you truly did out of a pure heart for him. The sacrifice, the willingness to take risks, the willingness to step out on faith, your willingness to win souls, your willingness to be embarrassed for the name of Jesus, your willingness to pick up your cross and follow Christ. All the things that you may have done that nobody saw on earth, nobody saw, but you were faithful and nobody was looking you will be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ with crowns and uh, all kinds of rewards. And, but, you know, this Christian idea that we all get into heaven equal, <laughs> people are in for a rude awakening. I'm sorry. We don't all get into heaven equal. And, and somebody needs to be hit over the head with a ruler. Uh, we get into heaven, those that have been faithful on earth, they will receive a higher level of authority and responsibility in heaven than those who were unfaithful here on earth. <laughs> yeah, you get into heaven by grace and grace alone, but the level of your authority, the, the level of responsibility that you get is contingent upon your working out your salvation with fear and trembling and your faithfulness down here on earth. So I think people listening need to understand and talk to their friends if they're open to it. We all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and you should fear that, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's not. It's not something to be trifled with. No, that's that's true. I, I certainly fear. You know, that's always something that Joe and I talk about uh, when we do this radio broadcast, and uh, we we never want to be in a position where we. Don't do number one. Don't do our best. I mean, we know we're going to fail. We're, we know we're going to miss the mark. We understand that we're fallible, but we we never want to be in the position at that judgment, at that moment of judgment. And uh, well, a a, a a um something that we often refer to this uh, uh this this question that 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 we is often asked, you know, if you were charged uh, or, or arrested and charged for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you 
and, and you know, um, standing before the the judgment, um, I, I I would, you know, I I know we're fallible. I know that. But what 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 frightens me is not pleasing or 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 being. Uh, I'm trying to think of the word here. It's not letting the Holy Spirit guide. Yeah, there you go. The shows getting in our own way. True and obedience. Obviously, there's no not going to be in an ever an intent to to be disobedient or bring it in a false truth. But uh, at the same time, you know, we do talk about being having to be responsible, having to to not only bring about what we see or we talk about what we want to talk about on the show, but allowing the Lord to, to do it. He uh, has put us in this platform to do. That's right. Uh, yeah. That, and, and, and with that, um, there's a blessing and a reward for that, but there's also, uh, you get, because in a sense you, you become spiritual teachers and you've raised the, the, the level of your responsibility before the Lord. So God blesses you. God, God is blessing you guys phenomenally and your program phenomenally. But but I don't even have to know um, uh, the realities of your personal lives to know that I know that because God has blessed you and you've made that commitment to him, that you go through trials uh, that are very intense uh, because the Lord is shaping you, as I do. I mean, you know, I'm a teacher of the Word of God, and when and when the Word says teachers are judged with a greater standard, it's not the emails I get from people who have rageaholic problems that shape me. <laughs> God, you know, that's not how God shapes me. Those get deleted and go in the trash. What happens is God will raise up credible spokespeople, family members, situations, which will go into my soul and heart and mind like an x-ray. And I, as a teacher of the Word of God, I have to discern between the voice of the accuser of the brethren, which is a spiritual warfare designed to take me down and is based on a lie. And this is very important because when you're a teacher of the Word of God or you're just doing uh, any obedience to the Lord, you're going to get attacked and not all of it is uh, God's chastisement. Some of it is demonic attack, and you have to be mature enough in the Lord and the Word to be able to discern from demonic attack versus what the Lord has raised up to chastise you, to straighten you out. And so in the process, I will get barraged with information that will just literally cleave apart my inner being and my subconscious and every aspect of my personality, where I will be taken to task, and I have to discern which is a lie, which is false accusation, uh, which is uh, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, because that's very real. But there are some times where I know that uh, a surgical cutting uh, thing is is that the Lord is in it, and He's exposing where my flesh is reigning instead of Jesus. And it's mm. not easy. It's not easy. You know, you get anybody who steps out for the Lord gets horrific trials. But you also get horrific, not horrific. You get incredible rewards. Yeah. Exactly. And uh it's well 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 I mean it's imperative as um, believers and as obedient followers that we engage that battle, we engage, um, and we, well, we we must engage. We must play our positions. I, I I understand that, and with that comes consequences and rewards as well. So I, I understand that, Paul. I, I can't believe this. Uh, looking at the program clock here, we got about nine minutes left of the show. <laughs> you know, it just seems like we just started. Um, I'm going to turn it back to you. I mean, I, I'm not even sure. Uh, you know, none of this is scripted, folks. Uh, to the listeners, none of this is scripted, and it's uh, where, where the, the spirit uh, takes uh, Paul and, and the show. That's where we, where the spirit leads us, where we go. But Paul, in, in the nine minutes remaining, what uh, what do you want to cover? What, what do you think is important that we need to we need to address here before we we end the show. Well, I think right now in America uh, we are in the greatest spiritual battle 
uh, that we've ever been in as a nation, and I'm talking about a spiritual battle, and that the stakes literally are life and death for the people listening and for their children. And and the future is not fatalistic and fixed. And, and, and what I hear the Holy Spirit saying, not that I claim to have this pipeline to God, uh, but what I hear the Holy Spirit saying uh in in the in in the conversations that we've had over the last almost three hours, what I hear the Holy Spirit saying is that uh, He's issuing a demand upon His people. That means you and me and Joe, but it also means every uh, uh, listener. The Holy Spirit is speaking to them and asking them a question, and it goes back to. To what you just said, Doug, are they are you willing to play your position? And I think the Lord is speaking to every single person listening to us talk, and He's asking them, "Are you willing to play your position?" Because the stake is life and death for our nation, life and death for our families. And guess what? Here's a reality check: If the Church of Jesus Christ had stood in the light before Hitler came to power, and had played their positions instead of hiding, they wouldn't have had a Holocaust and they wouldn't have had the, the, the most demonic Nazi dictatorship perhaps in, in, since the beginning of time. I believe that that did not have to happen. The, the demons could have traveled to another nation, but the church, was the individual Christians were not willing to play their position. Now that's fine to, to be able to blame the Christians in Nazi Germany, but the question I have that I don't think I'm asking from my own humanity. I believe the Lord is asking this question through all of our conversation. The Lord is asking the question to the people listening, are you willing to play your position? Because there's a promise with it. If you are willing to play your position, the Lord will back you up. And uh, the fate of America is not yet decided yet. And we can see... uh, uh, the, the tide turn to whatever degree the Lord allows it, and we can see incredible blessings and incredible, incredible restoration. Again, to what degree, only the Lord knows. But it, it's contingent upon every person playing their position. So my question to you listening is, you know, you know the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know what the Word of God says, and I'm, I'm just asking you as your brother in Christ, I'm no different than you what, in any way. I'm asking you, are you really playing your position? And if you're not, <clears throat> I'm not here to lay a huge trip on you, but I'm simply suggesting that you can ask God, you can go to your knees right after this show and fall on your knees and ask God to forgive you for not playing your position, but you've got to fess up and admit it. And the Lord will cleanse you with his blood of that sin. And then you say, God, I, I ask you to make you Lord of my life and that I'm willing to play my position now. And the Lord will back you up with his Holy Spirit, and the the tide, the spiritual tide of this nation can be changed. You know, all these people who email me as if they were called as prophets greater than Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and email me their prophetic declarations that America is damned, and nothing, God can't move in America. Every one of them are, are speaking to me out of a false prophecy. They, they aren't called by God to be prophets. How do they know what the future holds? And I don't, and nobody listening knows what the future holds. But God demands obedience. And nothing good is going to happen unless we play our position. So I think that's what the Lord's saying. I think that's what he's asking. And that's why I wrote my book, Mass Awakening. The whole purpose of the book, Mass Awakening, the whole essence of the book is this, that when crisis events happen throughout history, there either is a mass awakening of evil and the demonic, as what occurred at the end of the French Revolution with terrorism, as occurred in the Communist Revolution, as occurred in Nazi Germany with Hitler. It was a mass awakening of demonic. Or... When confronted with crisis like we are now, there can be a mass awakening that is good, such as was the case during the first great awakening, spiritually in America, and the second great awakening. And there's nothing in Bible prophecy, nothing 
that precludes a third great awakening from happening, at least on a temporal basis. And that's the message of the book Mass Awakening. And I believe that's the, the, the theme of the Spirit of God in this program. Play your positions. I mean, Doug, you said it well. Play your positions. Get out of the stupid bandstands shoving beer and popcorn down your gut and play your position. Get out on the field and play your position. Absolutely. Amen. And we're all called. You know, we were all born for this very moment in time. And, and Paul, you said it very well. You read very well in your book, Mass Awakening. We all have a purpose to serve. Uh, let's let's take up uh, that position. Let's let's play a position. Let's serve the purpose which we are meant to serve. Um, or uh, play, and of course, um, uh, stand in the gap. And uh, you know, uh, folks, don't forget. You know the Supreme Court coming up. Uh, well, later I think later this month or so, sometime this summer, going to be entertaining. Of course, the homosexual uh, agenda, if you will, the uh, redefining marriage for crying out loud. We 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 should be yelling and screaming. I mean, this is it's it's not a done deal. We don't. I mean, we we need to be proactive. That's just one example out of so many. That I could I could name, but but uh, Paul, I just want to say thank you so much. We want to say thank you for for your time tonight. And we again, I can't believe we've reached the end of the program, but we have. Um, I just uh, I just cannot thank you enough for being who you are, all that you do, all that you write. It's always a blessing when you come on uh, to us and to many listeners, and uh, well, they appreciate. It's, it's always a blessing to be on, and as as you guys know, and as I know, uh, you know. <laughs> It's by God's grace. <laughs> Period. Amen. So Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate All that, right. Paul. All right. All right. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Folks, that'll do it for us tonight. Uh, Once again, uh, I guess Paul McGuire, wow. his website, paulmcguire.us, his latest book, Mass Awakening. Pick that up as soon as you can. You know what, though, uh, too, Joe? I, I just urge everyone to, to drop Paul a, a, a line, you know, a an email, just a thanks, because uh, what a, what a, what a fantastic man he is, and uh, what a great message. If you have the opportunity, certainly, certainly let, let them know that uh, you're praying for him. And yeah, you know, all right. He'd appreciate that. Tomorrow we'll be back with Greg Jackson. Not going to want to miss that show either. Um, until then, stay safe. God bless, and have a great night. <laughs>